Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education March 6th meeting. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move to go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this body has jurisdiction, to consider matters that relate to the negotiations, to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, to consult with counsel, and to perform an administrative function. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. I have a motion and a second to go into closed session. For all the reasons stated, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We're heading into closed session. We'll be back at 6 p.m. Thank you. March. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting of March 6th. Please rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and then I would like to remain si for a moment of silence for our troops and our uh, first responders at home and abroad. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> First item on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Um, I make a motion that we amend our agenda to separate the February 6th and the February 13th meeting minutes. We had two members absent on the 13th, and we don't have a quorum to vote on those minutes. So we'd like to table the February 13th, min 13th meeting minutes. Uh, we will vote on the 6th, February 6th meeting minutes. So we just want to adjust the, amend, uh, the agenda to reflect only one set of minutes will be voted on. I second the motion. Okay, I have a motion and a second to amend the agenda to remove the approval of the February 13th to table those and only vote on the February 6th amendments. Mrs. Wright? Board members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Aye. Ms. Morissette? Aye. Ms. Carla? Aye. Yes. Thank you. I have five four in the affirmative. Okay. So now I'll move into uh, the approval of the minutes. I need a motion to approve the closed and open session minutes for February 6th. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve February 6th minutes. Mrs. Wright. Board members, again, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Thank you. I have four in the affirmative. Okay. Now we have recognitions. Wonderful. So please, board members, join me up front. Good evening, everyone. We're going to do something a little bit differently, so I just had to get organized a little bit. So good evening. It's good to see everyone. We do have some recognitions this evening. And I will start with our Energizer Bunny Award. So I'm going to ask for uh, Bayview Financial to come forward with Chip Brittingham and Wayne Humphreys and Mark Humphreys. <laughs> So this evening's Energizer Bunny Award goes to Miss Ramona Cudahy. Miss Ramona Cudahy, come forward, please. 
Miss Cudahy is the new addition to Stevensville Middle School. She's been a wonderful asset to the school and to the student culture. Her hard work and ability to build meaningful relationships with students has been instrumental in ensuring a social, emotional, and academically safe school environment. <laughs> Stevensville Middle School principal, Ms. Tara Downs, says we're lucky to have her. Ms. Cudahy is the school counselor at Stevensville Middle School. And did you bring someone with you this evening? Um, Ms. Downs. Ms. Downs, please come forward. And I see we have Mr. Fister doing photos tonight. So. <laughs> Next, we have our Difference Maker Award. We'll celebrate the students, some students who've made a difference at Stevensville Middle School. And this is the, little, the part that's just a little bit different. We have several that we'll recognize tonight. So the, uh, the Difference Maker Award goes to several young adults who've been working hard all year to achieve their goal. And their goal is to collaborate in order to make a change in the school environment where students feel welcomed, supported, and safe. So the committee collaborated uh, with the equity focus team to create a positive school climate for students. And the following students are being recognized. So when you hear your name, students, please come forward. That is Olivia Kelly. <laughs> Catherine Alvarenga. I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> Nate Ford. I'm going to fix me up on this. Trayton Jackson. Nathaniel Kotwicka. And Bushra Hussein. Congratulations, students. And do you have someone here with you tonight? I'm going to pass the mic so you can say if you have someone here. And if you didn't have a, a parent or a guardian, someone with you, guess what? You have Ms. Downs and you have Ms. Cudahy. So we'll have them. Hi, Mom. Mom, please stand. Come forward. We're going to do two pictures. My mom and my mama. Mom and my mom. My mom. My mom. Dad, and sister. <laughs> my mom, my brother, and my niece. It just happened. Don't tell me. And Catherine. And then we have Olivia. There you are. So let's see if we can all squeeze in and, and get this picture. Congratulations. Well done. Our next award is the Spirit Award. This award recognizes an employee who is enthusiastic about his or her job and our school system. This award is being given to Stephanie McKenzie. <laughs> Ms. 
Mrs. McKenzie is enjoying her first year as an eighth grade history teacher and the coach of the Stevensville Middle School cheerleading squad. She works hard to create a positive culture for students and her cheer team. She exemplifies someone who radiates enthusiasm, we can tell, and is dedicated to sharing that passion with both students and staff. My husband, my Come on, cute baby. Cheer coach, of course. And I have one of my cheerleaders here. Oh, why don't we have your cheerleader come up? Yes. And Miss Bounds. And Miss Bounds, go up to there. She is. The next award is the Shining Star Award, and this award recognizes a Queen Anne's County Public Schools support person who shines. Now, this award is going to Mr. Tom, am I going to say it right? Kreis, mm -hmm, from Stevensville. But Mr. Kreis is a history teacher. Mr. Kreis was nominated by his principal, Ms. Downs. So, Ms. Downs, you're going to come forward again. Mr. Kreis is a seventh grade history teacher at Stevensville Middle School, and in addition to serving as the content chair at Stevensville, he also serves as the lead on the Queen Anne's County History Expo Initiative. Well done. He works hard to ensure that the county has a successful history expo. Mr. Kreis has received the prestigious Middle School History Day Teacher of the Year. Yes. <laughs> award that was presented at the Maryland State House in January. Um, he, yeah, in January. He was nominated during last year's conference for his efforts in growing the Maryland History Day program in Queen Anne's County. Five years ago, Queen Anne's County Public Schools had 60 students participating. Do you want to say the number? And now we have... Over 4,000. Oh. Over 4,000 students. The Upper Shore Regional History Day, which hosts history projects from all over the Eastern Shore, will be held this Saturday at Washington College in Chestertown. This is a first for that event there. So congratulations, Mr. Christ. Do you have someone here tonight? Not with me, but I have, we have Ms. Downs and Ms. Cudahy. Come on down. And I have a, well, department member, and Stephanie McKenzie. Come on so. McKenzie. And we have a special award this evening, and this award is going to go some time ago. You may remember we had a very special Kent Island Beach cleanup, and we had an art project that was associated with that, uh, that project. That art was made up of trash that was collected in the beaches on Kent Island. And so we worked with the local artists and some of our high school students, and we had this art project travel. It went on tour from school to school to school. Tonight, we'd like to recognize a very important person. That is Miss Kristen Weed. She's president and founder of the Kent Island Beach Cleanup. Is Miss Weed here tonight? Oh, come on down. We are so grateful for what you did for us. Miss, um, we submitted a grant with the idea of fabricating an uh, educational marine sculpture, sculpture, which is the art project that I mentioned, from debris collected during that 2018 beach cleanup. 
the full color concept rendering of the sculpture, Many Hands, protecting our Chesapeake, was a depiction of many hands pushing debris up from the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. And that was created by Kent Island fabrication artist Lucy Prosser Cruz. Did I say that correctly? All right. And Patricia McCool. The sculpture and two vertical pop-up banners and educational materials uh, and pictures were displayed throughout Queen Anne's County Public Schools between October and February. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is so very grateful for the opportunity to partner with the Kent Island Beach Cleanup Projects. This has been an amazing opportunity for staff and students. We strongly believe the project has renewed a sense of stewardship in our students that will last with them for many, many years to come. Queen Anne's County Public Schools looks forward to continuing this partnership and educating our future leaders to make a better tomorrow. Thank you, Ms. Thank Weed. I have family and um, two of my board members here. So please join us <laughs> up front for a picture. <laughs> Drink. Yes, I'm her mom. Mom, that's my pleasure to meet you. Thank you. No script, but right here for the script. If you check with this, um, right there. Okay. I was, How are you? I was resting so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> we could have come over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sporting that NG, we like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ms. Downs to come forward once again. Do we have Luke Oliver in the audience tonight? Luke Oliver. Luke Oliver earns the Hero Award. Luke Oliver is a student at Stevensville Middle School, and we're going to have Ms. Downs to say a few words about Luke. Good evening. Luke Oliver is an eighth grader at Stevensville, and on his bus ride home, uh, he noticed a student in distress, and he came in and made sure that that student had help and was extremely brave when he was um, making, making sure the student was calm and felt comfortable. So we want to recognize him for the Hero Award at Stevensville. Congratulations. Anybody with you, Luke? Mom or dad? Mom, dad, mom, sister. Come on, mom and dad. dad no. We can get somebody to take the picture. Come on. 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 Hi, how are you? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Thank you. 
Have a good night. There goes everybody. I'm going to get down in 30 minutes. But is there any update you want to do about Not right reminders? Now. Well, I'll tell you, I've got a reminder of what these drills and all they need to do, but I kind of want to give them a heads up of what's going on. Okay. Yes, sir. Really? Serious? Wait. We can have another. We'll have another time. What? We have two. We got two, right? Times, but I don't know. So we got. Okay, next item on our agenda is the uh, board involvement. Um, uh, for, for myself, I just uh, wanted to bring up that I was a, we were able to go to the, um, the I was able to go to the um, Open Meetings Act training that was held, and I was delighted to see the superintendent came in, um, the executive team did too. We try everything we can to make these meetings professional and uh, in accordance with the law. So there was some good training in, involved in that. Um, and it's it's real technical stuff, and uh, we want to make sure we're in compliance. So a lot of people have attended, and I always joke that the executive team showed up. So they always correct me when I'm screwing up the meeting. So, <laughs> but I do appreciate their arriving, and um, so that we can continue to improve on the professionalism of our meetings. Anybody else have anything? I know we've been very busy with the budget and enormous other things, but Mr. Paluski and I attended. A little get together uh, honoring all the uh, recipients of uh, well, the people who were nominated to be a teacher of the year for this year, and that was that was a nice <coughs> event. Just describing to them what's the next process, and if any of them hope to go on to uh, for the gala on April twelfth. So that was a nice, nice little event. Excellent. And that's sponsored by uh, Fisherman's, right? Yes, it was. Thank you to the Schultz family for for um, hosting that. Anybody else? Dr. King. Very good. So I've got quite a list here. Um, February 7th, we had our school monitoring visits, and we've got several of those that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, so we visited Mattapeak Middle School and Mattapeak Elementary School, and we did several of them over the course of the, of the month on February 22nd. I'll just go through them now. We went to APA, uh, Graysonville, Bayside, Stevensville Middle School, but that one was in association with the state superintendent visit. So we had Dr. Karen Salmon, and we had a state board member, uh, Warner Sumter, who also joined along with Captain Kelly, and we visited several of our schools, and it was just a wonderful day. So thanks to all of those schools, the students, the administrators, and teachers who just made us feel so very welcome during that visit. And uh, Dr. Salmon commented on uh, how nicely things were run and, and how uh, well behaved the students were and engaged in their learning. So thank you. Uh, to all for that. Um, on February 13th through 16th, I was able to attend the AASA conference, which is a superintendent conference out in Long Beach in California. Um, I uh, was able to uh, participate in administering or presenting in a session on environmental education. I serve as co-chair for the Superintendent's Environmental Education Collaborative, and we also took superintendents out on a whale watching trip during a storm. It was um, something. 
<laughs> it was something. But we had a lot of fun, and we got some new partners. So Queen Anne's County is a partner, and uh, we'll be looking forward to engaging in some wonderful experiences for our students. Um, on February 20th, some members of my executive team and myself, we joined, um, we had a meeting over at uh, the Liberty Center. We met with Mr. Todd, uh, Mr. Moan, Mr. Seaman, and uh, Nicole Hefner, and we had an opportunity to give them some idea of our needs in terms of budget requests. Uh, not anything final like what we're going to hear tonight, but just to give them some idea. That's a regular meeting that we have at this time of the year every year. Um, you already mentioned, Captain. Captain Kelly about our Open Meetings Act um, training and was able to participate in that along with Mr. Pfister and Mr. Uh, Pluski and Mr. Pender. So thank you to them. On February 22nd, we also had the African American History Celebration over at uh, Sudlersville Middle School. Uh, I know that Ms. Pauls was there and several other principals. I know Mr. Uh, Walls was there. It was just a wonderful, wonderful celebration. There was a praise dancer, our students from the drill team from Sudlersville Elementary School. They did a routine. It was just a lovely, lovely event. So I was glad to be a part of that. And as the weekend went on, it just continued to um, be a recognition of Black History Month. On February 22nd, we were at Kennard's Black History Program. That's over at the Cultural Heritage Center, where it was hosted by our very, very own Miss Pauls, and she does a wonderful job. We recognized our seniors who were between the ages of 90 and 99. Yes, we had a 99-year-old in the house, and it was absolutely wonderful to recognize them, along with our students who had won the African American History essay, uh, essay Contest and several other recognitions for our students. It was a great, great event. Also on uh, the next day, on Sunday, February 24th, uh, Captain Kelly was a part of that recognition also. That was a recognition of Black History Month, along with New Beginnings, Church of God in Christ. Uh, that was a fabulous celebration. We were able to attend um, last year as well. We had an opportunity to engage in some fun activities, some games and things, so that we could uh, freshen up on our African American history and learn a few things as well. There was a speaker who uh, was the cousin of Emmett Till, um, and he really, really gave us a firsthand account of what happened during those uh, tumultuous times. So it was just a lot of history that day, and uh, we're, we're grateful to have had that, uh, that time with them. On the um, 27th, again, we had more superintendent monitoring visits over at APA and Centerville Middle School. I sit on a uh, task force for discipline for the state, and I had that meeting on the 28th where we had a panel of teachers, and we were able to have one of our very own, uh, Miss uh, Natasha Wright, who is the mother of our very own Arielle Miles, she was able to participate on that panel, and we talked about uh, discipline and how the laws in Maryland are impacting what happens in schools and in classrooms, and Ms. Wright did a wonderful, wonderful job representing us. On March the 1st, um, our ESMIC superintendents group went to Annapolis to make our annual presentation to the Eastern Shore Delegation of Legislators there, where our uh, Steve R. Arents is the um, the chair of that um, that committee, the Eastern Shore Delegation, I should call it. On March the 4th this past week, we had the Sodexo Future Cooks uh, Chef Cook-Off. And that was a really, really fun event. They were cooking Mexican dishes, and we just ate and ate, and it was wonderful. We watched them cook. They prepared delicious meals for us, and we do have two winners. We had Miss Caroline Winterstein, who is a fifth grader at Sellersville Middle School, and we had Miss Cindy Sydney Pender, who is a fifth grader at uh, Sellersville Middle School. Yes, that is the daughter of Mr. Sid Pender, and. So she came in second place, and it was just a wonderful evening. Miss Wright was there. She served as one of the judges, um, and it was just a great. So thanks to Bruce Forgrove and to Carolyn uh, Rochester for helping to make that a wonderful, wonderful night for our students. It was excellent. 
And so that brings us to uh, more uh, superintendent monitoring visits. We were able to go to Queen Anne's County High School and to uh, Kennard yesterday. And we have seen some wonderful instruction. Our teachers are looking for new ways each day to engage our students and really to help our students to perform to their very best. So we should all be very proud of what's happening uh, in our schools. We've got some upcoming events that are happening. Of course, I've got my superintendent meetings on Thursday and Friday with ESMIC and with PAZAM. And then we have the Upper Shore Regional History Day on Saturday, which I mentioned just a little while ago with Mr. Christ. That's going to happen on March the 9th at Washington College. And we have both high schools having their spring musical performances this weekend. And I'm sure you ladies will be talking about that. And that does it. I think you're busy. We've been busy. Mr. Paluski. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, many things that I was going to uh, address as well have already been um, uh, suggested by either board members or, or by the superintendent. Uh, we're finishing up. We have two more schools left for our school monitoring visits. Those will take place next week, Bayside Elementary School and Stevensville Middle School. So you can expect sometime probably this late spring, we'll provide you with another uh, update of, of some of the strengths that we're seeing across all of our schools and some areas that remain challenges. The only thing that I would like to add is that Mr. Tully on February 22nd and I visited um, leaders from Anne Arundel County Community College. Uh, and we had a great visit with them. We're looking to develop an MOU so that we can expand more of our opportunities for our students here in Queen Anne's uh, to also experience some, some higher education courses uh, and specifically some areas that, that currently can't be offered. Uh, so we're looking at those partnerships. So we hope to develop that MOU very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peluso. Is that for a du dual enrollment type of Yes, ex exactly. Um, we're looking at dual enrollment, dual credit, uh, also a, a potential early college uh, program with them as well. Uh, they have a variety of, of different uh, exploratory programs. So if a student, let's say, is interested in business, but they don't know what path in business. So there's a lot of opportunities. So students don't have to begin a whole series of coursework to figure out that they don't want to be an accountant. Uh, they want to be an entrepreneur. So we just found some, some great opportunities. So we look forward to bringing that MOU at some point, hopefully this spring, uh, to the board uh, as an update. And um, to continue to expand upon the superintendent's vision of, of more access um, to opportunities. Great. Glad to hear that. Okay, student board members, we'll start with Ariel. Good evening. I'm Ariel Miles, um, student board member from Queen Anne's County High School. Um, so first off on my report, Queen Anne's County High School is hosting a multicultural night on March 15th from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. hosted in the lobby and the cafeteria and this event is free of charge. Um, our National Honor Society is hosting a St. Patrick's Day 5K run fundraiser from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. on March 17th. Children under five years old are free. Ages five to 18 are $20, and if you're over 18, it's $25. And this will be held at Queen Anne's County High School. Spring sports are now underway. On Monday, all teams had their first practice of the season. Um, Queen Anne's County High School is putting on The Little Mermaid. They are performing on March 9th at 7 p.m. and March 10th at 3 p.m. The cost is $7 for students and $10 for adults. And lastly, our Lady Lions basketball team takes on Ken Island tomorrow at 5 at Queen Anne <coughs> County High School. The states? It's, uh, um, this is semis. Semi. Yeah. So this is the playoffs. Yes. So. Right. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Teddy? Hi, I'm Marissa Teddy. I represent Ken Island High School. Um, spring sports began this week. We have the Mary Poppins performances March 2nd and 3rd, and then this weekend, the 7th through 10th. We have our National English Honor Society inductions tonight, March 6th. We have our quarter three interim reports go home tomorrow, March 7th. The SAT will be at Ken Island High School this Saturday, March 9th. On March 11th, we have the March for Our School, so we welcome teachers to the Ken Island area and to use our parking lot. On March 14th, we have Winter Sports Awards at 6 p.m. On March 21st, we have Prom Expo, which is a pre-prom event where girls get to model dresses and boys get to compete for the Mr. Ken Island crown. Mm -hmm. crown. And then on March 26th, we have a music showcase. On March 27th, all juniors take the SAT during the school. On March 29th, we have our Student of the Month ceremony. State testing continues in the month of March, and our band performs at Carnegie <coughs> Hall in April. So big congratulations to them. 
Our Lady Bucks basketball advances in the bracket after a terrific win against Easton yesterday. They will play QA tomorrow at Queen Anne's County High School, so go Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Okay, moving to our presentations. This first one's on educational equity. So we're going to have Ms. Pauls and Mr. Engel to come forward. Uh, you may know, and I'm sure they're going to mention, that we have moved in this state from education that is multicultural to educational equity. And uh, Ms. Pauls and Mr. Engel will share some information with us. Good evening, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, board members, student board members. We're excited to be here tonight to present the educational equity um, work that we've been doing here in the county. My name is Janet Pauls, and with me I have my partner, Mr. Brad Engel. Good evening. So we have several purposes tonight. The first is to share the work that the committee has been doing, and then, as Dr. Kane mentioned, to talk about the transition from education that is multicultural to what is now education equity, and to share some successes and some areas for growth in our county. So first is the old definition, education that is multicultural. And I tried to spend some time finding when it first originated and couldn't, but I would chance to say it's been this way since the 90s. Um, and in 2016, the State Board of, Eca uh, State Board of Education worked to amend it, and it, withdraw it was withdrawn and in 2017, and then this year it has changed to the equity um, which Mr. Engel will talk about. And I just wanted to highlight some of the definition here. And then as Mr. Engel talks about how it has changed, you can definitely see uh, how and why. So it was more of a, an integrated approach. It really focused on diversity and curricular infusion and how students live, learn, interact, and work creatively. Creatively, and it really looked at a lot of diverse factors that are mentioned in that definition, such as race, ethnicity, region, religion, etc. And so we've kind of walked away from that definition, and Mr. Engel will share what it is now. Yes, we're we're very excited about this new uh, definition and educational equity because it means that uh, as is defined that uh, students have access to the opportunities, resources, and educational rigor that they need <clears throat> throughout their educational career to maximize academic success and social emotional well-being. So we like that they've added all these pieces and understanding that you know we're looking at the cognitive, social, emotional, and physical abilities of students as well as their ethnicity, family structure, gender identity, expression, language, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomics are all kind of key to this, this new definition. So we're very excited about moving forward with this work. Sort of a, just an overview of the structure and where we are with educational equity. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have an outstanding relationship with the Queen Anne's County Local Management Board, and they have provided lots of funding and lots of support uh, through Mike Clark and Joe Gravitz and the, and the group. Uh, we have the Multicultural Proficiency Committee, um, which has had a lot of activities and a lot of interest and a lot of great conversations. And speaking of conversations, uh, through our committee, um, We've had our conversations on race that many of you have attended. We've had these. Uh, we've had seven over the past few years, and we think these are great opportunities for students and parents and community members to uh, engage in <coughs> these important conversations. Uh, we have our educational equity uh, committee uh, that is now co-chaired by Ardina Hamilton and Rondell Sorrell. And uh, you know, as we look at these issues and. We have uh, our annual Celebrating Diversity in Youth uh, event that we hold every year where we get a chance to recognize students who are really moving this work forward, and that's really where it, it, the critical piece of it. Um, we have some guidance from MSDE, and so we are currently working on a disproportionality action plan, obviously implementing the new educational equity regs, which talk about having 
the lens of equity in everything that we do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that is very important, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a classroom, um, having that lens of equity involved in everything that we do. So again, we're very excited about this. And from the um, school system's point of view, we have two initiatives this year. One is the Cameo Group. They have been working with the um, administrators and supervisors throughout the school year. We have four schools identified as target schools. Mattapeak Elementary, Sutlersville Elementary, Stevensville Middle School, and Queen Anne's County High School. And they have been working with each of those schools to look at continuous improvement. They have created site-based equity teams. They have met with those teams at least twice, two full days, and they have another day coming up, I believe, in April to meet with those, day, uh, those teams. It's job-embedded professional development, which we know is the best way to make change. Um, there's lots of coaching that is involved, and each school is developing their own equity plan that is unique to their population and the needs of their school, and it has gone very well. And then both of the high schools have um, worked with equal opportunity schools this year, and those um, teams began by collecting some data. Uh, surveys were administered to staff and to students. As a result of those surveys, they create, created equity pathways, which were reports that analyzed those, uh, that data. They talked about different views on equity, mindsets on equity, benefits and barriers, and the main focus is to increase uh, students par student participation in AP classes, and it would be those students that usually would not take one of those classes. Um, some of the data was that 84% of students at Queen Anne's County High School felt as though they would, were able and would like to pursue further education in a two-year or four-year college, and 88% at uh, Ken Island High School. And then they identified specific kids, and each of those kids, they created a, um, a plan for them. And um, they had insight cards with their goals and their interests and any barriers that they might have. And one thing that was very um, individualized for each of those students was it, they had a trusted adult in the building that they could go to and they felt as though they would be able to talk to, um, to, to that adult. And many of the students had a trusted adult and some of them did not. So there were about 50 students identified at um, each of the high schools that would fit the criteria for a, um, an advanced level class. And now that each of the schools are developing outreach plans and support plans to reach those families and find ways to um, bring those students into the honors classes. And we just had a meeting actually on Monday and Tuesday at each of the high schools. And then we just had Queen Anne's County High School's monitoring visit. And they have met their goal and probably will surpass their goal of having um, 50 plus students. And Ken Allen High School is working diligently on their plan. So we feel, um, we feel good. We feel good about the progress that we've made just in one year and bringing in students that otherwise would not have thought of participating in an advanced level class uh, into those classes and, and providing a support system for those students. So we have a lot going on and um, Brad and I have been working for the past couple of years on different events. And we started out with the 1994 race equity audit profile and um, that report came back from MSDE and it gave us some successes and some areas of challenge. And then ironically, in, um, when we had the curriculum audit in 2017, what we did was we actually compared the two, we saw lots of similarities and we developed an action plan for the county. But in between those times, the LMB had reorganized their cultural proficiency committee, as Mr. Engel spoke to, and then we uh, started to have some system-wide professional development as well. So with that action plan, one thing that um, resulted was the Innovation Center was created to address the issues in the audit, and we specifically had a subgroup that really worked on um, equity at that time. And then, as Brad said, we had the conversations on race, and several, three, at least three of those were just for educators, and the last one that we had, we had over 150-plus um, attending. And each year, we go back and revisit the action plan because it is data-driven, and we make some adjustments as needed. 
And then, as Ms. Inkle said, we also have the monthly, um, what used to be education, that's multicultural committee meetings, but now our equity, educational equity meetings. We really try to focus on having the lens of equity in everything we do. Again, we talked about the equal opportunity schools, the Combio professional development. We have two um, schools, the APA and Mattapique Middle School, who are doing a, a restorative practices pilot and um, having success with that. We do have minority achievement coordinators, and Ms. Riggs was here tonight um, with her, her family. She is one at Cat Island High School, and we have uh, Ms. Sykes at Queen Anne's County High School. And then for human resources, we really try to focus on the fact that all interviews, the, should, uh, the committee should be representative of our county population. So it should be a mixed group of uh, folks sitting around that table. And then, of course, we can't talk enough about how successful we were with our challenge day. The first challenge day was held at Queen Anne's County High School, highly successful. This year was brought to each of the four middle schools, and um, I'm a huge supporter of challenge day. And on uh, March 29th, we're going to be, Dr. Kane's going to be joining us. We're going to be going to Bowie State University. We're going to be taking 40 of our uh, seniors, and we're very excited because many of the students um, attending, if they bring their transcript uh, and their application, will get accepted on the spot. And so we're very excited about having that opportunity. Um, and that is a partnership with the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. They're going to be coming as well and joining us on this trip. Um, we've had some professional development for bus drivers. And I spoke about the um, reducing and eliminating disproportionality, a local action plan for the Queens County school system that we are working on. Uh, curriculum and supervisors, instructional practices and materials, and school equity walks. And we've mentioned the Sunday supper conversations on race and the gals and girls read. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, the, the old COMAR, which is the ETMC, is going to be repealed, and then the new regulations are going to be approved on, I think, May 21st. It'll be final, but it's all set for approval. Again, reiterating that the lens of equity is, should be a part of everything that we do. It should be a part of every agenda, every classroom, every school-home relationship, every PD, all school climate initiatives, and every, again, everything that we do should have that lens of equity involved a quick question to do in the individual schools or have they been talking about the lens or have we got it down to that level yet um, well we're just, just we have we have not and so I think what we need to do is we, we need to meet and we need to sort of talk about what that's going to look like. like like I said I think it needs to be in everything that we do and start having that conversation and putting it everywhere and what does that mean to have that lens of equity yeah so right. we need to define that what that means and I'm still learning this. We're still learning this. Um, and I think some of the schools who've been working with Cameo may yeah. have a head start because right. yeah. they had, um, they've had some equity walks in their building. They've walked through each of the classrooms and look at, looked at some equitable practices. And I know, for example, at Mattapique Elementary School, after their team met and they had their um, equity walks, some of the teachers realized some just some very minute changes that they could make, such as if their classroom was representative of all of the students. And it could be simply with their, each student having their, their work posted or a picture of the student. And um, it, was, it was easily done um, and changed in those classrooms so they can monitor that progress. So uh, they're, they're getting a handle on what it should look like and, and providing some examples. And again, it looks different in each of the schools, but we have, I think, started to, to really examine it a bit closer. Does anyone else have any? Can you explain what the restorative practices pilot is? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a model and it's a way of restoring a relationship. And it's used uh, oftentimes with student discipline. If there's a discipline infraction and there's some kind of a damage, either a relationship or, you know, some other destructive event has happened, it's bringing the parties together in a healing manner, and it can be done in a it can be done in a circle. It can be done informally. It can be done formally, and you have to be trained in, in restorative practices. So um, you have to get somebody who gets the training. They come in and they sort of mediate. It's 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 a form of mediation where you bring people together. It doesn't work where there's a a 
imbalance of power. So in other words, this situation wouldn't work for a bullying situation. But if there's a conflict between two students or something happened and there was some kind of damage, yeah, then it's a way to bring people together and restore the relationship. Because, you know, oftentimes we have disciplinary infractions and a consequence and maybe a suspension, but I mean, how are we sort of restoring what happened? And this is a way of doing that. So that's it works just well a, with staff as well, yeah. too. I've seen it work with staff. And it, we, we get their consent, first of all, before we bring the parties together. Yeah. And they have some guiding questions that they pose to, to each of the, the participants or if it's a group um, of folks to, to really try and see where the breakdown was. And a lot of times it's just in communication or something that happened and they're able to walk away. It's called restorative because they're able to walk away feeling that um, usually they've accomplished a goal of healing. And, it's restoring and confidence. Getting, oh. mm -hmm. It's restoring confidence yeah, right. in themselves and the system. Yes. Right, that's right. Yeah. And students can. And relationships. Can, and relationships. Yeah. 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 Students can are able to speak and sort of share how they feel. And if they were hurt by somebody, they can talk about that. So it, and we have trained staff that do this mediation you bring somebody in? Well, we have done some schools and we've had some administrators. This hasn't been a countywide effort, but we do plan on doing that. I know, again, Dr. Kane is, is a big supporter of this, um, you know, to get this off the ground. So we're still, we piloted at some schools. We did a lot at Anchor Points Academy mm -hmm. there. And, um, but it's not something that's system wide, but that's our intention is to do that. Yeah, we wanted to start small to see if it was making a difference. And um, one school, Mattapeak Middle School, Dr. McCoy is trained and has done some um, sessions at her school. Actually had the opportunity to sit in on one and it worked well. Thank you. So part of the work of the discipline task force with the State Department is looking at restorative practices and, you know, other social emotional learning and those kinds of things just to really have a, a toolbox of um, things that school districts, schools can use to ensure that as we discipline we're teaching and that we are not exacerbating an already disproportionate um, <coughs> set of data in terms of which students are disciplined, which are not and who is disciplined more frequently, those kinds of things. So, you know, it would take, and, and we still have lots of work to do on that committee, but it would take a, a mammoth effort for, you know, every school system in the state to um, engage in one program because we already know one thing may not work for everybody. So it's right now about doing the research and ensuring that we know that there are tools that we can use to teach behaviors without destroying relationships. In that vein, some of the um, um, representatives, political representatives have brought forward legislation, um, look, are looking at legislation that pertains to restorative measures. In, in, and mainly what the, the superintendent said, you know, and the whole thrust is, is a mistake they make in <coughs> high school shouldn't necessarily push them into jail. You know, they're trying to, they're tr trying to intervene in that process. And so when I heard you, when, when I read about a story, re restorative practices, they're actually figuring out a way to m mandate that legislatively right now, right. to be so sure these kind, this kind of disciplinary action and all it is, is, is looked at in that vein, not necessarily just punish them, you know, school to jail or whatever they call that. They don't want that to happen. Because they're kids and they're going to make bad decisions. That's right. part of growing up, and we have, you know, we have to help them. Support they're them. knuckleheads. And <laughs> <laughs> some of the things they do for no reason, you know. Yeah. So thank you very much. Anyone? Did our student members have anything you wanted to add? Um, I just want to make a shout out about Challenge Day. You know, because we've all we talked about it, but it, it is so important. And I, I would like to see expanded not just for the seventh grade, but again in tenth grade to reiterate the whole message and and I, I we haven't done it but i'd like to shout out to linda austin because without her i mean her support you know monetarily and and and, and f you know physically mm -hmm. being there every day at every one of the schools i mean kudos to her thanks her i thank her from from us from myself because i i was there and saw how much she did and i know you know, mr angle you saw it as well sure. I understand a grant has been written and hopefully it will be funded fully. I, I can't say enough about that challenge day. So, and thank you for supporting it. Sure, thank you. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you.
the next superintendent yep will present our budget request superintendent is going to present her budget request for fy 2020. She's uh, was loading it. I have, she I have my, my <coughs> hand with me. So good evening, and for the record, I'm Andrea Kane, Superintendent of Schools for Queen Anne's County. Um, and tonight, I will be presenting uh, my budget request. This is the FY 2020 operating and capital budget request. So the purpose of tonight's presentation, of course, is to give the board some background information on revenue and expense patterns over a period of time, maintenance of effort, and per pupil spending. Then I'll share my budget request for fiscal year 20. And I have with me, of course, for the record, our CFO, Mr. John Fister. So to begin, let me share some important data points and accomplishments for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Some of the points I'll mention may sound familiar and some may be new information for you and our listening audience. We have some things to celebrate and some areas which require growth, of course. In the case of the latter, we collaborate to create a plan for improvement and apply high yield strategies to garner positive results that benefit students first. As I present the FY20 uh, budget request, you'll notice a consistent message, and that is focused on our compelling why, which is our students. Almost 7,800, uh, just some key facts about uh, our school system. Almost 7,800 students in grades pre-K through 12. We have over 1,000 full and part-time staff members uh, comprised of about 565 teachers and 150 school-based paraprofessionals who directly support students. We serve about 589,000 meals annually. We employ nearly 30 bus drivers for Queen Anne's County Public Schools and about 50 bus contractors who drive over 2 million miles each year. Queen Anne's County Public Schools span from Suttlersville to Mattapique, from the Bay Bridge to the Delaware Line. We are eight elementary, four middle, two high schools, and one alternative education program. The most important factor in the success of our students is having a highly trained teacher facilitating learning in every single classroom. Offering competitive salaries in a highly engaged, supportive community with ample resources is absolutely critical to attracting and retaining excellent teachers, administrators, and other school employees. Our starting teacher salaries are competitive with other Eastern Shore districts with new teachers who hold a bachelor's degree starting at about 46,000 and those with a master's degree starting at slightly over 46,000. There are nearly 49,000 residents in Queen Anne's County, the sixth wealthiest county in our state with over 97% of those households having access to the internet. And let's not forget that Queen Anne's County Public Schools uh, is the largest employer in the county, providing resources and revenue back to our county in the form of well-prepared human capital, our students, ready to work, support economic development, and give back to the community. There is no better return on our investment. This slide shows teacher salaries across the state, and, and granted it is difficult to read. It will be accessible um, online after this presentation is over. Notice that Queen Anne's County Public Schools is lower than the state average in teacher salaries, but we fare better than many of our neighboring Eastern Shore counties, larger Western Shore school districts that pay significantly higher teacher sal salaries skew the statewide average. But overall, Queen Anne's County Public Schools is quite competitive with regard to our teacher salaries. And yes, there are many great things happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools, so let me share some of those great things that are happening. As you know, the new Maryland report card was released this past December. Queen Anne's County Public Schools earned high marks as evidenced by our star ratings. Schools could earn between one and five stars. Nearly all Queen Anne's County Public Schools earned four or five 
stars, and we have one school that earned three stars, and we are working on that. For the next, I'm sorry, for the third year in a row, you may have seen the press release, Queen Anne's County Public Schools is leading the state with the highest graduation rates. All schools are actively engaged in efforts centered on equity, as you just heard the presentation from Ms. Pauls and Mr. Engel. I'll speak about three of those significant efforts two you have heard about tonight, Equal Opportunity Schools. They, that really started as a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to assisting school districts with establishing infrastructures, policies and procedures which are necessary in order to realize positive outcomes for students who are historically underrepresented in advanced level courses. Our partnership with EOS involves examining and developing the learning culture within our two high schools and developing strategies to increase participation of minority students and uh, students that live in poverty in challenging high school coursework. Another is our work with the Cambio Group, which you've also heard about. They lead our cultural proficiency training and support schools in creating more equitable learning outcomes by ensuring that teachers teaching and learning process is focused on the following essential elements um, and, and those include cultural proficiency, equity and those things that you've heard about tonight. We also are working with the data wise improvement process. That is an eight step process for using a wide range of data resources to improve instruction. It supports a culture of collaboration um, in terms of data inquiry, which is centered on evidence to identify and resolve learner centered problems and problems of practice to improve student achievement. Um, and a question was raised a little earlier today about, you know, how we look at um, what's happening in the classroom and if we are able to uh, get through some processes data-wise helps us to look at our data through that lens of equity. So we look at our data and we triangulate data and we determine what some of the learning problems are. And then we address those learning problems by looking at our and observing instruction. And then once we have some identified problems of practice which address learner-centered problems, then we can resolve some issues and we can experience high performance for all of our students. So we're working on that. Our schools are highly engaged in that. Another, I wanted to respond to the question about uh, that lens of equity. But another thing that we do in terms of looking at data through a lens of equity is our SLOs. So all of our teachers and our administrators are involved with setting um, goals in terms of student performance and we can also target student groups uh, that need to show some increases in their performance and that's also a way that we look uh, at um, our data through a lens of equity. Dr. Kane, uh, for those who don't know what SLO is? a student learning objective. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. So this slide shows a 9% increase for our students who come to kindergarten ready to learn. That's a shining example of our efforts to identify children early who may have difficulties. Another uh, accomplishment by accessing solar power. We expect to stabilize costs for the purchase of electricity for the next 20 years. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is also the first school system in the state of Maryland to have a battery backup system to store unneeded electricity that can be used on cloudy days or when demand exceeds production. So now let's talk about our budget development. <coughs> In an effort to ensure alignment of our budget with our district goals and priorities, we should first talk about our five-year strategic plan efforts. Number one, of course, is learning accountability and results. Number two, and this is from our strategic plan, so we certainly want to be sure that how we spend our dollars aligns with the goals that we have for our district and these are the areas that are identified in our strategic plan. Um, so again, learning accountability and results, safe and sec uh, safety and security, operational effectiveness, human capital, and the last one is community partnerships and engagement. Our budget process. 
though we have an intense, we've had intense discussions regarding our budget, uh, particularly around this time of the year. In reality, our budget process is never ending. So uh, for those who may not be able to see, we sort of go in a cycle. If you flip back one time, please. We sort of go in a cycle from the top and we move around to the left. So we start with budget discussions around about July, September, as soon as we know what we have. Um, we uh, begin to prepare an analysis around October to November. We work with schools. Uh, we have some budget decisions that we start to make to narrow request right through December and February. And then we start to have our budget discussions with our county uh, commissioners, our county legislators. And then as we move to May, we are looking for our county to approve a budget for us. And then of course, come June, we have our budget reconciliation and adoption. And all of those things that I just mentioned basically are on this slide. And as our graphic showed on the, on the last slide, it is a continuous cycle. And without reading each one of these, because I really explained it in the last slide, we also include those public work sessions and our budget survey is a part of, of that um, process. And now for our, our budget development, of course, we craft the budget to meet the needs of the district and again, in alignment with our district goals and priorities. Of course, you know that it is in Comar that the superintendent's, bu superintendent's budget presentation um, start with our Board of Education. And I am responsible for taking the initiative to prepare and present that annual budget, to seek in every way to secure adequate funds from the local authorities for the support and development of the public schools in our county. Of course, we look for our budget, um, our approval, and then, of course, our budget is sent to our county commissioners for approval once our board has approved them and adoption in by July 1. I just mentioned our budget um, survey a couple of slides ago, and I'm proud to um, say that we increased the number of respondents. Last year we had over 300, this year we had over 400. So that is catching on and folks are participating in that survey. And some of the results of that survey are on this slide. Our parents prioritize lower class sizes, higher academic achievement, and increased student safety. Our employees who responded to that survey prioritized increased compensation, newer facilities, and more employee benefits. And the community members that responded to the survey prioritized higher academic achievement, increased student safety, and competitive salaries and benefits. I also would like to note that 50% of respondents <coughs> believe that adequate county funding is the greatest challenge facing our school system. And of course, our school board priorities are listed here. You decided that employee compensation, low class sizes, student safety, and advanced educational opportunities were priorities. Hang on, just give me a second. I've got something out of order here. All right, and so this slide, as you can see, uh, shows that most of our funding comes from our county and state resources. Um, any federal money that we receive is restrict restricted for certain purposes, such as Title I and um, IDEA, which is associated with special, ed special education services. So about 35% comes from the state and about 58% comes from our local government. As we look at our budget by object, you will see, once again, 85% of our salary of our uh, budget is encompassed by salaries and benefits. 85% of each dollar budgeted goes toward salaries and benefits. Queen Anne's County is the sixth wealthiest county in the state of Maryland, and our wealth per pupil continues to increase, yet we consistently fall among the lowest in the state and per pupil funding. As shown here, 
though some of our prog some progress was made during uh, FY15 and 16, we start to slip back down to the 20th in the state in terms of our ranking uh, cost per pupil. Our fund balance. This slide shows what Queen Anne's County Public Schools holds in fund balance as of the end of fiscal years 2014 through 2018. There are two lines that make up our fund balance, the assigned and the unassigned. The assigned fund balance are funds we have to hold in reserve to cover costs such as annual leave accrued but not yet paid, encumbrances, purchase orders, outstanding at, the en at year end, and future insurance costs. The unassigned fund balance are the funds we have to cover any unexpected cost or budget overruns. As you can see from this table, our overall fund balance averages around 3%, but our unassigned fund balance is around 1% of our total budget. The Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA, uh, best practices recommends two months of operating expenses as a reserve. Even taking salaries out of the equation based on GFOA recommendations, our unassigned fund balance should be approximately $2.5 million. So yes, we have less than half of that recommendation. And it is, you know, not um, something that we are happy about, but we have had to dip into our fund balance in order to balance our budget for the last several years. Now let's talk a bit about maintenance of effort. Maintenance of effort is a funding level imposed on counties by state law. The law requires county governments to provide as much funding as they did in the prior year on a per pupil <coughs> basis. So the county is required to provide as much as they did bef the year before, we know that. Uh, the local contribution for FY18 and 19 was zero dollars more than the minimum level required by maintenance of effort law. And just as a point, we wanted to be sure that you understood that five out of the last nine years, Queen Anne's County Public Schools has been funded at or below maintenance of effort. Now, for the sake of those who, um, you know, would like to have a, a more clear definition, understanding of maintenance of effort, we do include this video, uh, which explains maintenance of effort in an animated version uh, in layman's terms. So we'll take a look. Meet MOE. Hi there, I'm MOE. MOE stands for Maintenance of Effort, a state of Maryland law signed in 1984. It requires local governments to provide, at a minimum, the same level of education funding per student from year to year. MOE sounds like a solid plan to protect da, education da, da, da. funding, right? Well, not exactly. <laughs> Maintenance of effort is a misnomer. MOE only maintains the same level of educational services if costs remain the same, and costs rarely stay the same. Prices just keep creeping up. We all experience this with our own personal finances and monthly bills. So while the MOE law provides for funding at the same amount per student from year to year, it does not account for the rising costs of educating students. MOE does not address inflation, wage increases, and the rising price of goods and services, such as fuel, electricity, health benefits, textbooks, computers, and other school materials. So with costs rising every year, funding at the maintenance of effort level actually means reducing our level of support for our students. Well, I didn't know that. Well, it's true. Let's say we have a school system with 2,500 students with local funding per student at $10,000. This school system receives $25 million from its local government. Assume the next year that enrollment stays the same. If funded at the maintenance of effort level, the school system would receive $25 million again. But assuming an average cost increase of 2%, the school system would need $25.5 million to provide exactly, but no more, than what they are currently providing to students. So, they are half a million dollars short. By strictly using the MOE equation, this school system would need to make budget cuts. The same per student funding actually equates to less goods and services. And this equation does not account for the need for new programs, initiatives, or new strategies. When enrollment increases, the MOE law does provide for additional money per student as provided in the prior year. But it does not fund the additional money needed for the rising cost of educating all its students. This budget shortage could lead to larger class sizes, reduced services, and less student programs. 
While maintenance of effort gives us the floor or the minimum for education funding, it should not be considered the funding ceiling. We must factor in rising costs and the growing needs of our students so that our children receive the education they deserve. Thank you. And again, that may be uh, um, repetitive information for some, but there, it may be new information for others. So we thought that it was important to include that. So as we go back to our uh, PowerPoint, uh, for 2019, Queen Anne's County had the fourth highest increase in wealth per pupil, and that was 4.4%. Queen Anne's County, <coughs> along with 12 other counties, did not meet the education effort criteria as the county's um, education effort of 1.21% was not as great as statewide education effort average. Therefore, an additional amount of MOE will be imposed for 2020. Education effort for those who do not know how it's calculated. Education effort is determined by evaluating three factors. The one is the lesser of the county's increase in local wealth per pupil. The second factor is the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil. And C, a flat 2.5%. It was determined that because our local wealth per pupil uh, growth was 4.4% and the statewide growth was 3.2%, the state imposed the minimum per law of 2.5% to the per pupil allocation. Note that education effort is MOE. There is no other interpretation. Education effort is MOE as required by state law. It is not an additional amount allocated over MOE. So in 2019, our per pupil allocation was about 7,500 per student. For 2020, it'll be just over 7,700. So now we'll talk about the proposed budget. This budget requests $4.4 million or 5.5% more funding than fiscal year 2019. As you can see, we are expected to receive nearly 700,000 from the state of Maryland, exclusive of any funding that may come our way because of the Kerwin legislation. This budget also requests 3.7 million more in county funds, which is nearly 2.6 million more than maintenance of effort requires. As a matter of information regarding current commission legislation, the state and House bill uh, released the um, the state and the House released the bill aptly named the blueprint for Maryland's future on yesterday. So please stay tuned for more information on that. Our fiscal year 20 budget requests are organized by funding priorities. So as I mentioned a little while ago, we aligned our budget request with our district strategic plan goals and priorities. We're going to talk about them in terms of mandatory cost, which are those required by law, statute, or contract. It includes negotiated agreements, health insurance and other employee benefits, vehicle insurances, and contractual increases. It also will, uh, you'll see that it is segregated by cost of doing business, most, I'm sorry, must, which must be provided in order to maintain current operations. That includes compensation <coughs> increases, staffing requests to maintain class size, and budget right sizing. Our funding priorities also include program continuations, and that's district initiatives that have multi-year implementations. Um, some examples include equal opportunity schools and data-wise, which we just uh, talked about. Also, additional considerations in program enhancements, which include new initiatives or programs not currently being offered or expansion of current needs. And an example of this will be the uh, virtual academy pilot or the maintenance staffing. Now, as you saw earlier, the district's five progress indicators or, or strategic uh, plan um, priorities drive this budget request. From this illustration, you can see that, in fact, the entire $4.4 million request directly ties to these five uh, goals. 
The first goal is the strategic goal, and that is a learning and accountability and, and results. And within that goal, the requests include current classroom staffing over hires, and I'm happy to explain what those are. We had um, we hired a teacher to reduce class sizes that um, grew beyond what we thought they would once school got started or right as school started. So one of those positions went to Kent, um, I'm sorry, Kennard Elementary School. Uh, you may be familiar with the situation in class sizes for unified arts, particularly in the area of music at Centerville, I'm sorry, yes, at Centerville Middle School. Um, and we also had a teacher, I'm sorry, Stevensville, I'm sorry, yeah. And we also hired a teacher for uh, Stevensville Middle School. So those are the three over hire positions. We have requested four positions in this year. Uh, for FY20, and those are school-based positions um, that are required to address class sizes. We have um, asked for 20,000 in materials of instruction to supplement our science curriculum, stipends for curriculum writing in the amount of $10,000, and equal opportunity schools to continue that contract with our two high schools for 30,000, and the virtual academy pilot for 107,000, just over 107,000. The second goal is safety and security, and our requests include 28,000 for security maintenance contracts, that's for cameras and security equipment. We're asking for $8,000 for athletics officials. We're asking for about $100,000 for facilities and building uh, services for maintenance contracts and supplies. The third goal is operational effectiveness, and we are asking for $180,000 for our transportation <coughs> bus contracts, which is uh, our current contract ends at the end of this school year. Transportation for a new bus route for Kent Island, for the growth that that's, that's experienced there for 29,000, and transportation for two late buses for Kent Island High School. We currently have buses for Queen Anne's, but not for Kent Island, and we need to rectify that. Goal four is human capital, and in that area, we're asking for $43,000 for uh, to continue with our teacher retirement cost health insurance at 200 and just over 270,000, compensation for settled agreements that we already have in place, 473,000, almost 474,000, compensation available for negotiations at about 2.4 million, and then compensation to increase compensation which has not been adjusted for probably about 20 years for substitutes and home hospital teachers. We are not making any additional requests in the area of our fifth goal, which includes community partnerships and engagement, but we wanted to um, give really a recognition to some of our partners that are out there in the community supporting our schools and really working to ensure that we give our students some really good experiences and, um, and we just wanted to recognize those many, many partners. Now, this is, this is where the tough decisions uh, needed to be made. In any budget process, tough decisions have to be made uh, to balance between need and a reasonable request. Some of those requests include additional school-based staffing needs, additional school-based materials of instruction, curriculum and instruction, that's for software, materials of instru instruction, stipends, additional maintenance staff, additional facility and maintenance needs, um, an internal con um, audit contract that's centered around the legislative audit recommendations, and those come to a total of about $1.3 million. All of those items are easily justified as a needed or necessary priority. However, we are also aware of the fiscal constraints of our county. We had to make tough decisions after many hours of decision, discussion and deliberation. We will not include any of those items in our fiscal year 20 budget request. What you're looking at now is a summary of the requests that I've just uh, spoken about for fiscal year 20. Nearly 91.6% of this request directly impacts the classroom 
with 8.5 positions, compensation increases, and a modest increase in curriculum needs also necessary to support classrooms. This budget request of $103 million would be funded primarily by the county government at about 58, almost 59 percent, and the state at about 34 percent. For fiscal year 20, 85.2 percent of each dollar budgeted goes toward salaries and benefits. That may only be a 0.2 percent increase over how we spend each dollar currently, but it does point to the fact on a percentage basis that more money funnels to salaries and less to other items which are crucial to keeping the school system running. We have to pay our employees and, and let it be left to any of us. We pay them absolutely as much as we could, but there are constraints on our budget. So, but that is the majority of our budget. So for our capital budget requests, we're looking at two major construction projects. That's the Centerville Middle School Feasibility Study and the Feasibility Study for Central Office. We're looking at systemics, Bayside Elementary, partial roof replacement, uh, also a partial roof replacement for Ken Island um, Elementary School, and the fire alarm replacement for Churchill Elementary School. In addition, we are looking at some uh, facility assessment related items, ADA upgrades for about three million, I'm sorry, 3,000, building services for lighting upgrades at about 165,000, building shell, that's windows, gutters, downspouts at about 100,000, interior painting and tile replacement at about 520,000, site work, sidewalks, asphalt, those types of things for 540,000, and foundation repairs at about 100,000. We're looking at some other items in terms of safety and security for 410,000, bus replacement at 413,000, vehicle replacement at 150,000, which we'll tell you more about tonight on that one, classroom technology replacements at 70,000, our technology plan, we'd be in year two out of five years for 1.6 million, and of course textbooks at about 600,000. And we're also looking finally at uh, cameras for our buses, 99,000, equipment replacement for 90,000, walk-in refrigeration units at 260,000, playground equipment at Churchill Elementary School for 232,000, um, phone uh, PA intercom replacements for 150,000, and track resurfacing to support Kent Island High School and Queen Anne's County High Schools at 150,000. So together you've looked at about 6.9, almost $7 million for the capital budget request. So what are our next steps? What do we do? Of course, we've got to consider, you know, if we only receive uh, maintenance of effort, that means without full funding, there will be uh, little um, to no compensation increases. Uh, possible staff reductions in 2018, I'm going to read from the bottom, 2018 we reduced our staffing by uh, one school base position and five central office positions and as you know last year in 2019 we reduced our budget uh, to accommodate for eight teacher position um, reductions to eight teacher positions. We're looking at no program improvements. We'd be looking at state and federal compliance concerns. We'd be looking at uh, maintaining uh, current services, um, jeopardizing the maintain maintenance of our current services. So, of course, you know, I would like to share with you, this resonated with me. And, you know, it's a powerful, powerful statement. This came from one of the parents who completed the budget survey. And the comment was, to us, you are not preparing our children for the future here at Queen Anne's County Public Schools, which is why my husband and I are seriously con considering moving out of here within the next year. We want more for our children than we believe the system can provide. That resonates with me because we are a very good school system and we, our students perform well, our teachers are top notch, uh, we have competitive salaries in our district, but we are falling behind in what we are offering our students. 
We're falling behind in terms of world languages. We're falling behind in terms of STEM offerings. We're falling behind in, in arts. We're, we're falling behind in a lot of areas. So where we're, we've been doing well, we're doing well with um, courses that are not moving forward to meet the needs of producing students who are global citizens. So we've got to do more for our children. And I know that every person in this room is 110% behind supporting our students and always supporting our students first. So again, without full funding, class sizes are in jeopardy of increasing. We currently range from about 1 to 21 or 1 to 23 at the elementary levels. We could see um, class sizes 1 to 24 or 1 to 28 at elementary and middle schools and higher at our largest schools, which is exactly what we do not need. Without full funding, um, technology demands continue to go unmet. In the, one of the slides, I, I read to you what the asks were, but you later saw that we had to strike through all of those asks because we were not able to uh, get to a place where we might be able to offer that up in our budget requests. So a real life example, only <coughs> three of 28 classrooms at Mattapique Elementary have a smart board in 2019. So without full funding, last year we talked about status quo versus growth. So without full funding, we are accepting status quo. Across the state, school superintendents are required, as you know, I just read Komar, to present our estimate of needs and requested budgets to our school board and our local government. Queen Anne's County, as we know, has pockets of poverty and suffers the ails, similar to many other rural school districts. However, that's only part of our county's story. The rest of the story boasts wealth, which is reflected in the growth we see every day with our, as our new courthouse is built and staffed, as new communities are developed for families and for seniors, as roads are repaired, and yes, even as new turf fields are installed. Many facets of this county uh, reflect that we are in a growth mode. And this is great to attract business for economic development, to boost real estate sales, to continue to grow wealth. But again, this year, I'm forced to pose the question, what are we offering in terms of improving our schools? Some of the issues raised during last year's budget request have been addressed by taking a Band-Aid approach, which some might even call it duct tape. Uh, the computer science teacher for Queen Anne's County High School, uh, we were able to address that need with a temporary fix uh, by pulling a, a, one of our employees from the com a computer lab at another school. This employee was uh, working on um, certification and we were going to take care of all of that, but that's a, a Band-Aid fix. We are all familiar with the situation at Center Middle School with the music classes. I ended up speaking with about 200 of our parents that were upset that class sizes could not remain small. We were able to put a substitute at Centerville Middle School uh, to rectify that band-aid. We are at the same situation again. We are requesting a teacher for Centerville Middle School, but it's a Band-Aid approach if we are not able to hire the teachers that we need to support our students. And it is quite, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. So these are some of the things that we're doing in order to offer our students what they need. Um, but again, we need a systemic approach and we need an approach that's really going to address the problem and correct the problem. I'm not going to go on and on about um, some of the other offerings that we really would like to see for our students, but you know, it's with great disappointment that this year we will not ask for any new programs for our world and classical languages, for our fine arts program, for our STEM. Um, none of those will be in this budget. I am, however, pleased that we are able to present in this request a pilot for a virtual academy that may serve to draw some families back to Queen Anne's County Public Schools who may be homeschooling their children or who may have children enrolled in other costly private school programs. I'm hopeful that the virtual school pilot will be approved as it could serve to increase our revenue in years to come. <coughs> so. With that, I am asking that you give consideration to the information that you've heard this evening and vote to approve this budget. May we answer any questions for you? 
Dr. Kane, thank you very much. Um, you summarized well the situation we're, we're in. Um, and just to clarify those, those two little examples of those are the actually over hires, which you have included in the budget. Correct. So it kind three. of explains the over hire situation because we're sitting in the same situation where we were last year. The, right. With, if we don't get funding for those three. Right. So that's the kind of detail that we've gone into in a lot of our budget discussions and a lot of the, um, the, the thought that went into this, the amount that we're asking over what we are told by law that they have to provide. So uh, the county commissioners have to provide, which is our maintenance of effort, which includes our equity. I mean, our, I'm sorry, our education effort that Correct. you explained. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the board members, any uh, input, and, and if you, uh, student members, I'd like to include you into this if you have some thoughts, okay? Anyone have anything? Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I had missed the last meeting, so I had some questions about the virtual academy. Are the students in, required to enroll in Queen Anne County school system in order to take part in a program such as that? That is correct. So the students, it would be a Queen Anne's County Public Schools virtual academy. And so therefore the students would be enrolled in our school system. They would not physically come to a school building, a brick and mortar building, but they would be enrolled in our school system. They wouldn't have to take any classes at our brick and mortar building? No ma'am, they would, would not. Would it make them eligible for clubs and programs outside of the school day? We certainly could make that decision. I can tell you that, um, you know, different districts do it in different ways okay and would they be required to meet state mandated testing they would and that's where we're going to have a stumbling block i believe with the targeted group that we'd like to get involved in this because that's the main reason they're not in our system they parents don't like the state mandated testing um, and what does the $107,000 cover? That covers 1.5 positions. So we need a half a, a position for someone to um, organize um, our special education or provide, let me back it up, to provide special education services for students who may have IEPs because that still would be our responsibility. So we have to plan for that ahead of time. That would be the half position? Half. And then we need a person to coordinate the program. So that'd be a 1.5 positions, one for the coordination of the program and one to offer special education services. Why would services. we pay a program coordinator such a high salary compared to what we bring our teachers in at? This is not a teaching position. Well, let's rephrase that. What is an average program salary for us? So the request is for 107000 so half of a teacher is, is about you know $30,000. And so the rest would be uh, for the coordinator of that program. And includes, of course, the fixed charges. Thank you, Mr. Fister. The, the fixed charges, you said? Yes. Right. OK. OK, so. Because it's all not so just this, people. That's not just a person. No, it's, it's salaries and benefits, itself. just like we do with our own employees. But. And you have to buy the questions. program. The, I'm sorry. And you have to manage the program itself. Oh, absolutely. So you have to pay for the, the classes and so that. And that's all included in the 107? Okay. That is correct. So part of the, um, the per pupil um, um, allocation for having that student enrolled would be what we would consider revenue for us. The other part of it, and I'm not sure what the percentage would be because it depends on the vendor, the other part of it would be for the cost of the program. So in most of these uh, virtual academies, everything that a student needs is included. So whether we're talking about a book, a computer, art supplies, a musical instrument, all of those kinds of things are included in that program. And so that parent is not paying for that program. We did the survey and we contacted several of our parents who are homeschooling their children and several of them, and I believe that we shared that information with the school board, were interested. And so that's why we said, well, you know, We'll, sh we'll shoot for the ones who said that they were interested in, in, in getting more information about that. So we considered about... But were they aware of the state mandate? State what mandate for what? For testing. For testing. We didn't get into that kind of detail on the survey. Sure we wanted enough, to know yeah. if they were interested, and we'd get back with them with more information. Gotcha. So it could very well be, Ms. Harlow, that they are not interested in having their students test. I can tell you that I did this program, and I've mentioned it before, in um, Virginia. And... Um, 
again, enrolled 1,100 students in, in the first year and earned $800,000 in revenue for our district. Uh, I don't anticipate, because that was a large urban area, I don't anticipate right. those types of numbers, but we did have some responses to say that certain, several of our parents were interested and we're going to go with that. Gotcha. Well, the other thing, I see what you're saying, um, Sharon, but the other thing is, though, it's, we have, we have an obligation to meet the needs of all the students, and some students can thrive in an environment like a virtual academy as opposed to going into this classroom. Absolutely. So that there's other reasons we would think about doing that, and other reasons we may have students come in. I mean, it may not only be somebody that's new coming in and, get, and helping us get funding. It could very well, though, meet the needs of a certain student that this is the best way they respond to schooling. And, um, and I agree with you, Captain Kelly, and we, and we just won't know until we have those in detailed conversations with those families. So we've started the process. And our asks for new positions was four? Yes. Okay. Is it possible to get this sent to us because it didn't come up on the computer? Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. I try to write stuff down quickly, but it's going too fast. And when we move into our action, we will vote on the budget. So does anyone have any more questions or no? Oh. Thank you. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't do well. that here? Um, after the, it's after I mean, this is just fine print, but we had talked about some of the transportation items had changed a little, and that was going to affect the bottom line, that we were not going to have to do a separate route down on Ken Island, that that had been solved without those dollars, correct? Pardon? So we, we do have some information that we can, we're happy to share greater detail. Okay. Um, Those things were quite preliminary. Because the turf fields is my next question. Coming up to that, we're coming up well, to that next. Well, that included us paving the stadium track, and yet I thought that was part of. We don't know yet. We don't, yeah, it hasn't. It hasn't developed that way, but I thought also that, that t triggered me too. Is that capital? Right. Yes, but is but that going to be part of the uh, turf field? On how the numbers come in. So uh, we see, have to put it on our capital request at the moment. Yes. Because we're not sure how the turf fields are going to pan out. And we were already had on our capital line item for <coughs> resurfacing <coughs> Allen High School. Okay. Before correct. The turf, okay. Okay. The turf That's issue correct. Came up. Okay. But we have to have a place for it vote on turf fields without <laughs> knowing some of this well let's get that's why we're doing that afterwards yeah we're, we're. Okay. okay any more questions thank you thank you very thank you. much thank you. One of them, not both of them. Okay. Okay, we now we have our community participation. Yes. For public comment, we ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should <coughs> sign in the roster, including their telephone number and address. Is there any more on there, by chance? Wow. Thank you. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Uh, organizations uh, get five minutes, individuals three minutes. Questions or statements to the board should relate to it, a recent agenda item, and a, an item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Uh, those items are discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those on matters of appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff, member, staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizen particip participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. 
If you have specific questions to the board, uh, we'll make sure that a perfect staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offer your critique. Um, the very <coughs> first name is Taylor Harding. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Kane and Board of Education members. My name is Taylor Harding. Say it if you like. My name is Taylor Harding, and I'm a seventh grade student at Stevensville Middle School. I would like to share with you that I am very excited about the opportunity to have turf fields at both high schools within Queen Anne's County. I know that it is a lot of money for the county to spend, but I believe it is a great investment. <laughs> Playing on turf fields in Anne Arundel County for years with my, fr with my friends on multiple teams. Over these years, I've seen firsthand the benefits of a turf field. With our normal spring weather, a turf field makes it so we don't lose practice time or games to bad weather or poor field conditions. Lastly, having turf fields at both stadiums will provide a great opportunity for our park and recreations and the middle school teams to host many games and enjoy championships on a field that is always playable. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Well, well Thank you. done. Thank you, Ms. Harding. Next up, uh, Richard McNeil. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Richard McNeil, and uh, I represent the retired school personnel. Um, I'm still learning the name, but we're in there. My first question is, hopefully everybody on the board received our newsletter. If you didn't, let me know, or, and, and we'll take care of that. But we've tried to get that out, so thank you very much. And um, one, uh, I, I appreciate the budget presentation, and I know tough decisions were made, but I do appreciate from the behalf of the retired personnel the continued effort to maintain our uh, health care cost. Uh, we do appreciate that more than you know, and uh, sooner or later one of you folks are going to retire, and you're going to appreciate that too. Um, Dr. Kane, I know you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the curve of the report, the, and, and I know that they're really working on a funding uh, formula for that. I don't know how Queen Anne's is going to play out in that, but I, I appreciate the, that you and members of the board are on top of that because I think that's going to have an impact over the next several years, not just one year, but over multiple years. And um, a lot of effort has gone into that as we all know, but I, I know that it's uh, important to keep up to date and appreciate you doing that. Uh, I know from our standpoint in the legislation this year, there's been very little effort on uh, pension uh, contracts or anything along those lines, or even an attempt to uh, bills to change the current uh, pension plan. And, and again, we appreciate that from, from our standpoint. Um, I was at the uh, uh, Queen Anne's High School this morning, and it was wonderful to see the class of 2029 uh, coming to see the play, the musical. And uh, these were second graders in there, and uh, they were so well behaved. I was amazed. I'm thinking, okay, if, if some high school seniors could just be that way, we'd be in better shape. But it was great. I uh, encourage you, if you haven't seen the, uh, the the two musicals, I saw one last weekend. It was phenomenal. I'm going to another one this weekend, and it's uh, just great. I'd like to mention that last Saturday, uh, both high school's uh, choirs participated in the showcase in Easton. Uh, even with the bad weather, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a not good day, uh, but it was great to see them in competition with some of the very large schools from the Western Shore and uh, on the Eastern Shore. And don't know the results, maybe these ladies know, but uh, uh, I know the report came back and I know there was 5,000 up for grabs for the whole thing, but uh, I don't think we got it. But anyway, it was just great to see them on that. And one last thing, um, I was up at Sellersville Elementary School today and we know that that's an old building. But what the staff up there has done to brighten the hallways, um, good job. I'll give you credit for that. Sure. Sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it is an older, is older nice. elementary school and uh, with narrow hallways and low ceiling, and, and it's tough to, to brighten that up. But what they have done to put messages on the walls in fluorescent paint and in a nice way, 
uh, I think it just adds to the atmosphere of that school. So congratulations to, to the group up there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Karen Fields. Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Fields. I'm a middle school teacher at Centerville Middle, and I'm also president of the association. I wanted to give you an update on the March for Our Schools. We've had a terrific response. Um, it's take, it takes place March 11th. There are buses leaving from Queen Anne and Kent High. However, um, the seats are going fast, which is great to say. So if you want a seat on the bus, you need to reserve it. And um, since we're in this together, can I give people my school email if they want to do that? Absolutely. Karen.fields at QAPC qacps.org you can just send me an email tell me um, where you're going to be and if you want turkey ham or veggie in your sandwich so there is power in our schools in addition we're asking parents staff and the broader community to call or email state senator Stephen Hershey to urge him to support HR 87 um, this bill has moved out of the house and to the Senate it expands membership at the State Board of Education to include two teachers, and one parent of a public school student. It's hard to believe that's not in there already. Um, but the state board needs those important perspectives. Um, I can't imagine our own local school board without parents on it that actually have children in our school system. So that would be an awesome move forward. And finally, regarding the budget, there are always competing priorities. However, we ask you to reflect on those priorities and their effects on staff and students. With ever more frequencies, frequency, emails are posted with vacancies in support positions and teacher positions in our school system. For teachers, leaving a position in mid-year at one time was very rare. Staff needs to see career, path, career paths that lead to professional and monetary growth. In these times, staff are beginning to speak with their feet. We have brought these concerns regarding retention to the board and commissioners each year, and now our students will, be, will begin to feel the consequences of the retention issue that we're having. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Thank you all very much. Okay, next item on our budget is the turf fields. So, Mr. Pender, you give us a quick update. Um, sure. We're going to be following that with a vote. Yes. So, basically, the Queen Anne's County Commissioners have allocated $2.3 million to install two turf fields. Um, the money, 296000 is coming from state program open space grant. The one point, basically $4 million is coming from Parks and Rec um, impact fees. And the remainder, about 640000 is coming from general capital projects funds uh, from prior year balances. So this is money that's really not allocated towards salaries or anything like this. It is money coming from Parks and Rec County Commissioners and their, their fund balance. They are going, made a motion at the last uh, meeting they had, um, I'm sorry, in uh, February, that they were going to build two fields either in our stadiums with your approval or they would build them on county uh, parks one up north one south um, the Queen Anne's County Commissioners are seeking approval um, from the board to uh, proceed with the construction on school property because it is Queen Anne's County public school property and they need your permission to do that um, with that being said we've had a couple rough years with our fields we have about 60 games in the stadiums each year um, there's not enough recovery time matter of fact this past year we had to move several games a home football game at Ken Island High School to a high school in Frederick because our field was not playable we've also had to move uh, lacrosse games to Broadneck High School that were playoff games. We've also had to move playoff games um, from soccer to um, Anne Arundel Community College. We do not play any games in the stadium for um, preseason to try to maintain the fields. Um, there's a lot of other 
issues that are coming up with our fields. So looking at the turf part of it, what the county would like to do is enter into an MOU with us, Parks and Rec, where basically the turf fields are going to give you about 10 to 12 years before you need to replace the turf out there. Not the sub base or the base, but just the turf. Um, a lot of counties have been successful doing this, of renting out the fields to make up that money over 10 years to pay for the replacement um, of the turf. Again, we're not just looking at this as you know athletics. You can still have graduation on the stadiums. You can have the band out there practicing on the stadiums. So they're looking at trying to make this a, a community effort um, and then recoup some of that money that was put out there. I will say, like I said, if we go this route, it will save us from having to reschedule games, from having to move games. Um, I know we have a athletic director in the back here. If you have any questions for, they can can help you uh, give you some more examples on this. Um, there's less injuries on the turf field than there would be on the regular Bermuda grass. Uh, Miss Harlow had a question earlier about the tracks. We would. Most likely, you're going to be running all the infield uh, in the stadium is going to be removed. All right. So we're going to be driving over top the track with major machinery. The game plan, if you approve this, would be to start in uh, mid-May and then have it done before school started. Um, that's the timeline. There's enough days in there that with weather that it's not going to really hold us up a lot. It's a local company that they've uh, put this out to bid. Mm -hmm. There was three presentations given. They selected uh, field turf for the installation, you know, whether it's at our stadiums or it's, you know, on a county field. Um, currently, under the regulations at Queen Anne's County High School, if we wanted to play a soccer game like we just had this year, the girls were in playoffs, we couldn't play in the stadium. One, it wasn't somebody was going to get hurt um, because of football and um, just the poor conditions. And look at the weather we've had this year with all the rain. Um, so we actually had to move the field onto their practice field to play a regional championship, which caused a lot of issues. Now, the stadium in Queen County High School, the width is not a mandated field. So we would have to remove two or three lanes, basically two lanes on that track, all right, to put extra, because you need to have 10 feet of extra width on each side. We'd have to remove two lanes of that. The second phase of that would come back. Queen Anne's County High School would get a new track the following year installed there, um, a rubber track, not a you know, poly, poly sprayed on track. Ken Allen High School's track is an eight lane track, all right? Queen Anne's is only six. So we're, it's, you're really not having um, the track meets there, which is kind of unfair to the students that are there because again, it's not a eight lane track. It's not a true regulation. It's more of a European track. Um, so the following year, we would come back and add the new eight lane track at um, Queen Anne's County High School. This year, the money you saw up there that said 150,000, that would go to resurfacing um, Ken Island High School's track. Two eight you, lanes. No, it's, it is currently oh, eight oh, lanes. Oh, well, gotcha. Ken Island is in a better situation because that school Five and stadium there. was built later on, and it's a lot newer than when Queen Anne's County High School was built. Queen Anne's County High School has some major drain issues on the sidelines along with, with Ken Island. Um, there is, there are, you know, the MOU we are currently working on needs to be, you know, spelled out. Um, but basically, I can tell you this, the Queen Anne's County High School, Ken Allen High School students would all would have first priority, you know, followed up by um, Parks and Rec, and then followed up by like the travel teams, the rec teams, you know, Pop Warner, those kinds of, of uh, groups. Um, again, I just, I kind of wanted to discuss about the money of the different places it was coming from. Um, because I know that some people are going to think that it's money that could be used towards salaries, and it's 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 not in that line item. So. Um.
Can I entertain any other questions on that? Well, I understand it's got a ways to, to go on the MOU. So, <laughs> yes, and, we, and all we, of this has to be detailed. We've um, worked on the MOU. The, the main object is getting the, because what's going to happen here is, even if you decide not to put them on our stadiums, it's going to delay the installation wherever they're going to put them because the companies are going to fill up, fill up, fill up because prime time is spring and summertime to inst install them. Um, my concerns were, can we still have graduation? Yes. You know, yes, we can still have graduation on them. Actually, it would, would benefit us having <coughs> them out there because then we don't have the chairs and sinking in the mud and all. This year's graduation, they both of them would be inside. Um, which, you know, knowing that ahead of time would, would help us out. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to this. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. I can see you having Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if, any questions of, of Mr. Pender? Because um, otherwise oh, yeah. we'll have a discussion on this. But Shall we, I go? I do me, do me far away. Let's all just okay. Questions? Well, we had to vote. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just to clarify, we had to vote on this tonight. Yes. We, Yes. With no MOUs in hand. And, and just for those people who don't know what MOU is, what is an MOU? Memo of Understanding. And Thank basically, you. the Memo of Understanding is going to spell out who's responsible for picking up the trash, who's responsible for the water sewer, who's responsible for turning on the lights. Who's so, responsible for the insurance, who's responsible for, yes. All that needs to be spelled out. So, yes, we, we are looking at that and going to have that developed. It's not fully developed yet. Okay, I mean, so... In business, would you actually vote and pay for a contract if you didn't have everything in hand? Does that even sound feasible to anybody? No. Okay. Like. Just put it out there. So in this MOU that you're discussing, currently the band at Queen Anne's County High School has control over the concession stand. How has that worked? That's another item that we're working at. And the concession stand at Ken Allen High School is utilized by the sports. How will that work? That's Especially especially, and I'm putting it out there because these fields will be used for outside venues to come in on weekends. Can our schools, can our sports and band programs have concessions there in order to help their programs? And this is, I mean, that you know, is, this is just business. I can tell you that that is part of the MOU of okay. spelling that out of having <coughs> the school have the first option to have the concession stand. It has to. I mean, I, I mean, I, we're talking oh, about our school system. Okay. And a no compete clause. If the concession stand is open, you yes. can't bring outside food vendors Correct. in. Correct. Or they follow the same rule that they do now. Correct. Outside of the fence and outside of the area and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Got so, you. and then we're going to, we're okay, just I'm following what we did. We're going to have $150,000 of resurfacing a pavement that they're going to run tractors over no, no, no. to fix the That's field. Gonna after, no, after. It's going to be after. It's all over. Okay. Yeah, after. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And I understand the timeline and your concerns and all that. I'm just... Yeah, look, I, look I, I'm in support of the turf fields, don't get me wrong, but I'm also in support of, of a feasible bases. MOU that benefits the school system and, and our, our, our students. Because that's, that. you know... It doesn't leave us hanging with dry. any questions. That's right, and yeah. that was part of the first conversation that we had with commissioners they expected we agreed that that was necessary we had mr pender to start working <laughs> on it right away have we met with them yet about it no we've not they know that it's in the works and this is something you know we're, we're not working on our own timeline here we're working on one that's been but to sit here and us. expect us to vote on this tonight without all that in hand i mean i, I i'm so i i'm just i'm being devil's advocate here which Damn. is my job well, part of the, the answer to that is if we, we must vote on it one way or the other or we lose the window of opportunity to get it, what we can say is have a vote on it um, and say that, you know, that pending this MOU, pending an agreement between us on the MOU. I, I will say that at the last commissioner's meeting, they said depending on the vote on the March 6th. Us. Us. Yes. That which, would determine what? where it would go where they would they be go. built right without an mou in place right. right and without all of our questions perhaps answered beverly i'm not going to interject yet your turn next we're in well, line i think our um I, i'm i'm very in favor i know we will lose the turf field if we don't make a decision to, to do it tonight it will go 
that should Betznik not Park. that should not be the way this is handled. Oh, that's how it's handling because Marlo, of, we're all on the same page. Yep, I, I'm saying that that's the way it is because I, I they, wish we had known that. Yeah, because well, that, maybe we could have. I'm just saying they have a deadline with the with the vendor. We just right? discussed part of this at last. And not the MOU, not the even MOU, a, not even the, the entertain March that. 6th, yeah. I'm sorry. The March sixth. We do. It's yeah. Because of the vendor, they have to lock right. in the we vendor. We just want to be clear that this, that was not this is just all based determined upon today. The no, no. Being that's available to do the work. Pardon? Uh, this is all based upon the vendor being available to do the work. I mean, they're asking you know us to rush through something, you know. Yeah, look, we can all sit here and whine and moan about the fact that, you know, we don't have what we have at hand. But let's be honest, we all want turf fields. I mean, well, I, mean, I can't speak for anybody. I shouldn't. Um, some people don't. But um, I, I just feel like, you know, it's kind of getting shoved down our throats. Might I ask um, Mr. Burns to come forward? This may be an opportunity for him to um, offer an opinion. Well, could we get through our questions first? And then yeah. maybe his opinion would be sure. more encompassing of all of our Go thoughts. Ahead. It's your turn. Um, are you done, Beth? Well, um, just one question that comes to my mind is where does the money go when we do rent these turf fields out to outside use? Is that going to be the same that, agreement that we have now in place? That when, money would then be put into a fund to replace the fields in 10 so to 12 years. So it's not going to benefit money, the money our would system not at all? supplant anything else in our system. It would be go back into the fund to maintain the fields, which is what most counties do okay. Howard County so we'll still do our ticket sales at the yes. door and get all that yep. but when we rent our field out yep. unlike renting out our auditorium yep. we will not see the funds for that can that I interject be, Mrs. Harlow mm -hmm. this will actually be the parks and recs field that that's, they would be renting out that's where I'm going thank that's you where I'm going so, so that's yep. an important part okay well, I understand and oh but I understand something different than that okay wait a minute. let her finish no it's just on the same topic the who gets the benefit of the monies for the, the, you know, for the visiting fields and all? I was told that in some of the fields in like Anne Arundel, they do give a portion of the money goes to Parks and Rec, portion of it goes to who re, you know re, a, a fund to resurface, and then the the actual high school themselves get a little bit of the money. But so I would say that's in their agreement. We right, and no, that's an right. In some counties, they in do. Some counties they I'll do tell that. you this: the the amount they get is smaller. Is it okay? And what goes into the actual re the redoing the field? Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be like a ten percent, you know, compared to where the uh, you know ninety percent goes back into the pot to resurface that field in ten to twelve years. Okay. Yeah, Howard County did it, and I think they've doubled. Now we're talking twenty five turf fields there, but they're. Um, investment doubled in what they were making off of that okay all right so i'm not quite finished i mean i i would want to ensure that the small majority of our student body that's going to benefit from this benefits equitably i know there are teams that will never play on these fields because there are certain sports that don't ever play on a dirt field but i would also question how are we going to balance that for that group when we have this large investment into an area of our system that's going to be so seclusive so exclusive what can we do for the baseball team that isn't going to ever play on a turf field that has to buy their hats and has to buy their sweatshirts because they only get four hundred dollars a year for their program I would like the commissioners to kind of think through some of that. I get that now that one of my questions is going away, the 2.3. I was under the misunderstanding it was county funds, mm -hmm. all generated through overages and uh, using very good fiscal responsibilities on the commissioner's part. I'm thankful that they've asked us first. I mean, this is a community project. Even though it's not going to benefit the entire community, I'm really delighted they came to us and gave us first choice in this. We have athletes who clearly are feeling at a disadvantage to their peers in other counties by not having this. I'm pretty split 50-50 and yay and nay. However, my constituents are not. They adamantly, overwhelmingly want these fields. And it's my responsibility to voice their opinions and to try to give them what they want. 
but I also want something for every student in this community and every student in this school system. And I would really like to challenge the commissioners to come up with something in the realm of a match, maybe not a dollar for dollar match, but something. These aren't education dollars. We weren't given the opportunity to pick and choose how we spent this money. I'm thankful we're being asked to benefit from it. But don't anyone un misunderstand that we're taking this from our system. We're taking it from our students. It's not our money. It's just been presented to us to be the benefactor of it. We have to be very, very careful about the, the, the presentation we're making to this community in, in supporting this. And I support it because that's what my voters want, regardless of my feel in it. And I'm about 50-50, so I could go either way. But we just have to really think this through. And I think when there's open-ended questions like Mrs. Harper has, and I think we've all echoed those, we're being asked to kind of do what happened here in town this week and why they had to have a special vote. Go to vote for this project, but we don't really know all the ins and outs of it. And, and we could end up in trouble. We could really end up in a, in a bind here. We haven't seen the contract. We haven't seen the MOU. Um, I'm not saying I'm of no vote here, but we really are being put on the spot, I believe, with lack of information and transparency. All the things everybody calls on us about. So that's the end of my rant. Sorry. So Shall just I'm oh, sorry. So one, we have about 690 athletes in the fall and spring at Ken Allen High School and about 614 in fall and spring at Queen Anne's High School. Plus, we did tour several schools looking at the fields and every school we went to had the PE department out there on the fields playing during school hours, so I mean. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't realize that. I also worry about male to female athletic time on these fields, you know. Um, we don't have male field hockey players, but we do have female field hockey players, and they're going to want some field time. But we also don't have female football players, and, and football players are going to certainly benefit from field time. I, I just want to make sure that of the teams that we need to see on that field, we can ensure an equitable balance for them all. It wouldn't be any different. Gender-wise and sport-wise. It wouldn't be any different than what you see now, and actually, it would benefit because you'd have field hockey out there where currently. I was going to say, but that's the problem. We I, don't have field hockey out there right now. So now if we the are field going isn't to, any to good. get them the out field there, field yes. so good. no, we will have them out yeah, there because. Yeah, which the, we don't now. No. Mrs. So Harlow, don't forget the band. And the band, I mean, it, it's, it's a plethora. Um, field hockey can't play in it because of the conditions of the field. Well, you've got the email. I, I get that, but I, the email from that. I just knew that field hockey never got field time, so I'm thinking to myself, field hockey parents are it one of my biggest. It would be a five, five sport field, so mm -hmm. there would be five different lines on the field for the different sports that would be able to play out there. <clears throat> and and the young lady that spoke, I think the most important thing she brought to this whole thing is we can't control the weather. And if these fields can handle weather that we can't handle now, that is 100% of our battle, well, in my opinion. And, look, and so that's a huge statement for her to bring to us as a, as a thought process. I mean, unfortunately, my children are grown adults and they don't play these sports anymore. So um, I mean, look at the to stay in touch. gate receipts that we, we have lost by m moving yes. to Frederick yes. for a football game. That, yes. oh, that's yeah. what Ken Allen High School is banking yes. on for their athletic budget. Sure. Um, you know, How about track? How about the track? Well, and track, well, yeah. too. I mean, you have 100 some athletes on the track team. Right. I mean, right. So. And would we ever be able to? Well, we have lost some of our state um, mm. semi. We've had to move uh, our yes, playoffs. Yes, yes, yes. Where we would have had the revenue of that particular game had we not had to go somewhere else. And the other problem we run into, we do have successful athletic programs here. And then once you get to the state level, they're all playing on turf fields. Um, so then we have to ship our students over to Anne Arundel to get some practice time. Right. Say, That's a huge concern of mine. I mean, if we're keeping our students at a disadvantage and our athletes at a disadvantage, that's not fair either. Um, but I don't think so. 
I, I just, I, I don't like these holes that aren't closed. Um, I have to agree with Mr. I mean, I, I, I understand. And I, mean, and I can't understand why they thought they needed to bring it to us with no more information than we have for a mandatory vote, take it or leave it. That almost takes the spirit of it away now. I mean, I'm very thankful they asked us first. Our kids want this. Our parents want this, and they want it at these schools. I can, I'm very concerned if they put them out in the fields, you know, at the 4-H Park or wherever. How do we compensate for the vandalism that's probably going to go on? We can lock our stadiums. I mean, seriously, this is a great thing. I can but tell I can you see what's it go happen. bad really easily, and, and I'm concerned. I can tell you what's going to happen. If they go to the parks, then you're going to have our athletic teams wanting us to bus them yes. to the parks yes. to play on yes. the fields. Um, but I, I understand. How close are we to the MOUC? We, we could have something by the next board meeting. I mean, we've been working on it, but it's stuff that you have to pull out. I mean, it's not like, you know, hey, I thought of this, I thought of that. You right. know, it's a different type of area. You can look at Howard counties. I've looked at. I've looked at Anne Arundel. I've looked at Montgomery counties. They're all different, but yeah. they also are more of a metropolitan area. Sure. Um, my biggest concern is to make sure that, you know, when you look at it, the okay. high school athletes have the times on there. Right. Okay, you cannot come on this field until after 8 p.m. Right. You're really not going to see teams, you, when I say teams, you're not going to see rec teams and travel teams using these fields <coughs> during the school nights. It's going to be on a Sunday. And then it's going to be after football's over through the whole like winter time, they will still be playing on them. And then in the summertime, they'll be playing. That's I'm good where you with that. I think it's bigger things that we kind of are worried about. No, I agree. That. I mean, there's when you look at the MOU, it's it's several pages long, and it's it, it takes into all that into account. I just working with the county and trying to get all the groups involved in it. It's not easy to get that done in the timeline I agree. that they ask me to do it. Uh, Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, just to cover this, the school would have priority whether it's a game or a practice yep. over anything else. So if it's a Saturday morning and the band needs to yep. be on that field, a tournament's not going to be overscheduled then. So yes, basically what we do is we take the calendar, we put the calendar out, um, all the tournament of bands, all of those things are already on there. The school gets first priority over that. Even if say we have a, a lightning storm or thunderstorm mm -hmm. and cancels that game, we still have priority. Um, part of the option is we give them a Bermuda field to go play on, you know, for that time. But that stadium field is for us to use first, no matter what. And then my next question is in regards to the stands. You already said Queens County's track is six lanes, not eight, so that widens your track. So now, now moves your stands. Yep. And they need to be ADA compliant. Yep. Is that money built into That phase? is in phase two for the following year when they redo the track because you're going to have to take the stands, move them back. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but it, fencing, lighting, and all that will be included in that. And that's about an additional $700,000, $800,000 that would be in phase two. Is Ken Allen included just Queen in that? And Ken Allen or? Ken, is Ken Allen going to be included Ken in the Allen. handicap? Ken Island in their stadium, very, it's very not, well. it, we don't have to move the stadium. But it is not handicap accessible yeah, at is. this time. It, it is. Yeah. There's no ramp up there? No. It? There's part, no ramp? Part of it is, no. part of, we just had them inspect it and they gave us a printout of the ADA. I can send you that. But the reason for Queen Anne's is that you actually physically have to pick it up. So once you change the aspect of that stadium stand, then you have to upgrade the ADA <coughs> compliance with it when the stands were built at Kenilon High School at that time, they met the ADA standards. Right, Queen so, Anne's is so old. Yeah. You've got ramps, you just have nowhere for wheelchairs to sit. That's, that's correct. So, and the, and the funding for the second phase, that's all county? That's all county also. So, and wait a minute, we're, let me clarify. Ken Island High School does not have ramps for wheelchairs. No, I know that. What I'm saying is, at when, it was, it, was when it was built, it was ADA compliant. If you go to change anything on those stands, then you have to spend the money to upgrade it. Okay, to so ADA. the stands are going to remain the same as they are. And at, right now, yes. At Ken Island. Yes. Right There's now, yes. nothing in the works to fix that. Okay, I just want to clarify. And and you say move the ones at Queen Anne's. We're not going to make them ADA compliant during the move. It's when they come back and get placed permanently, we make them ADA yes. compliant. 
during the meantime, there will be uh, some struggles that we have to do. Wait, how about Michelle's not, um, Michelle's, oh, not um, Michelle's not done? Michelle's not done. Um, I know there was a mention and concern about the visitor side on Queen Anne's, so that's going to affect those stands as well, or they're going to stay the same and just be moved back? Uh, they'll, they'll be moved back Okay. on that side. On both sides will be moved back, but you're looking at on the home side of putting in new piers for that yeah. to sit on and then taking a crane and basically moving them backwards. And cutting into that hill. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't, yeah. You're not going to be in that hill too much, but yeah. Is that still cool school property? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Just make sure. Shell, do you have anything else? No, my next concern was the concession stance, but you answered that with the MOUs. It's going to be set up so you guys have first choice, and then if they didn't want it, you know, you could have an outside vendor come in and do that. And if, if a piece of what's made on tournaments and such does come back to the school, I think that is where we can make it equitable for teams who will never play on those fields. And we as can far put, as we, that's still negotiating, mean, that's still, mm -hmm. you know, we can work with that. I mean, that's not a bad idea. It'll boost their budgets. That's a good idea. That would solve that problem. Well, I, if I could entertain just an idea about a motion, if I was to entertain a motion, it would be to have a temporary approval of the fields after the MOU is finished. I mean, that would be in the best interest of the system, and it would still tell the, the commissioners that we are in favor of it. So kind of like what Bev said, that we could approve it pending Correct. The, the support of the MOU with y'all's guidance. I mean, we aren't the experts no. on an MOU by any means. We would try hard not to be sitting there picking and pulling it apart. We would look for you experts mm -hmm. to say, this is what we need it to say and why you guys should support it. But right now, we don't even have that. So a pending I don't, approval. You know, yeah, I mean, I was so we could analyzing yeah, that. Yeah, I just don't want to put us at risk of not getting it, because we do that. Because and, well, they were pretty it, emphatic about it has to happen. And if it's going to take a month to do the MOU. If I could suggest when these MOUs are reviewed, to not only be reviewed by us and the employees of the school, but the coaches, the band directors, right, the yeah. the people who are going to use it. All, all the stakeholders yeah. involved in the this experts. process. <laughs> the experts that know. In case what there's they something we're forgetting. They to say. Um, all right. So. Well, I mean, here's the thing. How far of a time frame are we looking at? Do they need to know tonight because they have to sign the deal with the contractor? Is that why we're having? They've already signed a deal with the Okay, contractor. so the deal's in the works. It's about so placement now. It's, it's called, it's about when the construction can start. And in order for us to start in mid-May and be done by the time football and soccer and all that comes around, it would have to start in mid-May. Um, and locking in when the contractor can get here, that's the hard part. Because like I said, their busy season is spring and summer. Wintertime, they're not really doing turf fields. So are, we, are we not trusting that we can get the right MOU that they won't agree with us on something? I'm confident we can get the MOU. I, I mean, that's, you know. I guess that would be my question. Why delay it if it, we're going to get that all arranged in an MOU? And it, obviously he's made it, we've made it clear because, to him that's Because important. then we don't have any control over it. Not that we should have control, but if there is something in their MOU that we just absolutely as an organization cannot stand behind, we're still we're stuck to it we're because stuck. we've already said, Pending the MOU, we'll let you guys go forward. In, re in reviewing the other counties' MOUs, I don't see anything out there that really sticks out of. Uh, Mr. Burns is dying to say something, yeah, so sure. please. I, I want to put some concerns at ease because I, I, I've had experience in a couple of the other counties, for the record, Darren Burns Board Council. Um, it was actually only 20 years ago, give or take a year or so, that uh, Anne Arundel, which has been referenced a couple of times, had no turf fields. And now they're at all the high schools. And, and I tell you that, uh, Howard, as it's mentioned, has even more, even though there's less schools. And this has been repeated throughout many counties in the state. And I think the advantage of not being first is you will get, you won't have some of the pains they went through in developing MOUs, whether the MOUs with in the school system for who gets 
field time and who, who gets uh, revenues and things like that, how you handle extra revenue generation, all of that's been worked out over time for them. You'll benefit from that because as, as, as Mr. Pinder mentioned, there's, ex there's examples of MOU, MOUs out there already which they're working with to develop theirs. The second piece to remember is the law is pretty clear on who owns school board property. You as a board of education own your buildings, facilities, and your real property, your land, in trust for the public. And in fact, it's so strict and controlled by the state as well that even if you wanted to excess some property because you didn't need it anymore, you still got to run through approvals and it can only go to the county and it has to be by agreement. And I tell you that because, because you own this property, if you okay approval of something like this and they're installed, you actually have a lot of leverage. And I, and I don't want to get into negotiations out here, but I'm letting you know, you approving this and working with the county doing this doesn't take away leverage, it actually helps you as you negotiate the MOU because now everybody's moving forward. But how do we ensure we don't get stuck with a big bill in 10 years when this has to be pulled up and replaced? Or something happens to it, or... Because the I just, nature of the need for these turf fields is a shared community need. And, and what the experience has shown in the other jurisdictions is the, the county or whoever the municipality is. Uh, and in the city of Annapolis, it's sometimes Project Open Space, City of Annapolis, other state of Maryland, county and school system, all in these agreements. It's shown that the folks have a mutual shared desire to come together and make these things work. And I, and I, I don't know if Mr. Pinder is aware of any, I'm not, of where there's been some abject failure where it's not working. And so I guess what I want to let you know is don't forget you, you hold a significant piece of the leverage in that you are the owner of where these are located. And yes, are you the owner at the end of their life cycle? Sure you are. But I don't want to be the owner if there's a big dollar but amount there, for something But But keep in mind this, seen. there's a big dollar amount in maintaining turf of any kind, natural turf of any kind, of obviously the lost, lost opportunities for students. And so when you balance all those out, I think as you move forward, again, I'm not aware of disappointment by your peers in having gone this route. I think everybody's realized it solved their problems. And I guess I want you to know that you have some leverage if that's the right word so that if you are feeling time crunched and the worry is the MOU and Mr. Pinder thinks you're not far from having a good one done but if you're that tight on time I think you can take confidence that as, a, as the school system who will own these fields you have you have uh, enough of the strength in the deal <coughs> to make it happen the way you want. So what you're asking us to do is take a leap of faith. I wouldn't say that from a legal standpoint I'm just letting you know as you decide whether to take the leap of faith that you that don't look at it as it's someone else's fields and they'll control them. In fact, you will control them because you will own them. But do we understand that everyone understands that? Wow. Well, now that's we're splitting issue. hairs. Mr. Pinner, I had a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so for clarification, once the turf fields are done, there's going to be a year before the track is redone and fixed. Yes, we would have four lanes at the track which means we can't host any meets, which means we can't have senior night, which means we can't host Nesbit relays. That's correct. It would be one year without it. You would still have track practice and you could still have that, yeah. but the Nesbit relays and that, those things, no. But in the bright side of that, you would be getting a right. brand new track a year later that's eight lanes that um, is not polyurethane, that is a poured in place. And, and, and I didn't say this earlier in my presentation, but they call them the D zones and the end zones. So in those areas, that would be like your triple jump, your long jump, um, your pole vault, those kinds of things would then be housed inside of there <laughs> instead of outside like where they're at now with the triple jump at all. So the juniors and seniors of the next two years will not benefit from that. Yeah. I mean, that's where, you, that's where you're coming at, aren't you? Well, no, yes, but just also the fact that like I know Nesbit Relays is a big thing for us. We've been doing it since before I was born. So, like, that's something that they're going to miss out on. And senior night, all the other teams, like, where are we going to host our senior and night? And then we've worked with Ken Allen High School. We can, we've talked about <coughs> it also with Mr. Harding about, you know, accommodating those types of things in case, you know, when that comes up. Yeah. Because it is, there are going to be some issues. The other part that we'll have to, we have PFY that has about four 
um, track meets at each high school each year for middle school students. You know, those would be affected too, where we'd have to rely upon, you know, Ken Island High School to help out. Are we not that. putting a temporary track in, like putting them back the way they are before? Only four lanes. So when you, when but they we, are four lanes now, that's what I mean. There's six lanes six. at Queens High School. We oh, need to take six. out about two lanes. Uh -huh. In order to meet the drainage, the stormwater management, and all that, it, okay. it will have a curb going around the whole entire field that will have the drainage for that. Like I said, Ken Allen High School oh, already has eight it. lanes. Really, we can't it host at fixed. Queen Anne's High School a regional meet. No. You know, and the way it is now. The way it is now. I mean. Yeah. And, and, then the, and then the one at Ken Island will not be completed until the following year. So they can't have meets either with no, the damage that's done there. That, that will be done this summer. Oh, okay. Once we get done trucking in all the, the dirt and trucking in, out. So that'll be done this summer. You can get working on that, yes. Okay. So the, the time frame, with, May, yes. June, July. The problem with Queen Anne's is there's no need in putting in a turf field if you don't meet the regulations of, you might as well do it right the first time right. and get it done. Yes. Um, because why put a field in that you can't have a soccer game in or a lacrosse game in? Right. And they're going to pay for all of that, right? The well, we would purpose. The county's going to pay for all that. Yes, the county's paying. Whereas for that. if we tried to do it later, we we yeah. did that on our capital plan. Captain Kelly, I just had to one other thing. Uh, some of the other counties have experienced that's a success story on this is is when those project open space funds are allotted towards projects, whether it's whether it's county shared fields and or, or your fields inside your stadium. If you have success with that, it tends to draw more of those funds and projects in later years. In other words, when, when, they're, when the state or others are looking for partners, it, from what I've seen, they come back to the well. And, and so that's another thing to consider because part of these funds, as I heard, yep. are open space funds too. Well, we know about that. We know about state funding. And if you don't get in line in the beginning, <laughs> you try to go to the back, they won't bring you back up. Oh, we know. Well, I mean, loser. You had a question about the warrant. Warranty. There is a sh strong warranty with these products. But, but what is the and lifetime of one of these fields? Ten years. Ten, ten, ten to ten twelve years. years. Ten, what I thought. Um, um, and the warranty usually lasts that long. And one of the questions that we kept asking was, what is the response time for an issue that comes up? And it's a, basically a 24-hour response to the field. Um, you know, it's all based upon you have a good sublayer down. That's going to be your success there. If you don't. It, it, you're going to have issues. But then we're at bay in 10 years as to who the commissioners are and what the government, governing body feels as to, no, well, now we don't want to do that again. This is owned Fields by the Parks and Rec. Yeah, this so is. They have to that 10 year it. period, we're, we're going to be right back here again, right? Mm -hmm. I think what you'll see, I think, and I'm not speaking for the county commissioners or budget, but I think you'll see after. If there's success with this, I think you're going to see one at White Marsh Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you're going to see one down to Ken Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. We kind of saw that. We, we agreed with that. But what happens in 10 years at Ken Island High School when it needs to be replaced? That's and what I'm the saying. the county is kind of like, eh, well, well, let's go back to dirt. I mean, I'm just saying, what if? But yeah, the, yeah, the, the MOU that. will have that in there yeah. about okay. the okay. replacement okay. cost. Okay. okay. That. And what so they that's would where do the money you would raise over 10 years plan. would go okay. to, yes. But okay. Mrs. Morris, said, didn't you have some concerns about it? Didn't some of your constituents say that they had reservations about it, turf field? The biggest concerns I heard from my area were these are not school fields. They're parks and rec fields. And that's a concern. As much as they want to see their kids play on turf fields, they want to see the school control their own fields. But if this MOU is in place and addresses that, I think that will allay a lot of their fears. Like I said, this, this model <clears throat> isn't something that's new. I mean, this is used pretty much all around the metropolitan area of Baltimore and D.C. Matter of fact, the one we looked at at uh, Montgomery County, I think it had like five different groups involved in it. Uh, well, because face it, most school it. systems can't afford to do this for themselves. Yeah. So what, obviously there's a, what a prototype out there that's working for. And they're looking at the economic return the majority on, the, of these on counts. this of having tournaments, you know, and drawing people in and all that. You know, they have the Hogan's tournament and all. That's great, but it, it puts a hurting on our fields. I mean, yeah. you know, for having those. You want to entertain tonight? 
I, anybody, do you? I wanted to see two of the student members. I need your input on this. Have you heard or had them talk about it? Kids are excited. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only concern from my end, being the captain of our track team, is just what are we going to do for that year? Um, I mean, of course, it's awesome that you guys are going to end up putting in an eight lane track. Like, that's everything that we've wanted. But just some of the things that you're going to miss out on that our students are going to miss out on for that year. Like, it's kind of hard to replace your senior night at your stadium with all your friends and family there, like, supporting you. So that's the only real concern, I think, that I, our I, students I have. understand that. Yeah. I mean, and we've looked at it. And like I said, if we can use Kent Island High School <coughs> like that, which is an option, I know that's not your home school, I, I get that. But in order to have that track done and the fields done at the same time, it, it's like next to impossible to yeah. get done. It um, would have to start in May in order for it to be done by the school year. You'd have to start in March, you know, which oh. means now. May, which means there would be nobody playing in the stadium and there would be nobody on the track in spring, spring, which is, is not an option. So uh, right now it's at not. At this late date. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it wouldn't even be an option if it was on the table because right. I'm not, I'm not going to tell. Are they talking about having ready for football season? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. When school's and not, open, not to say that that's. After spring sports I, I'm, I'm not trying to equate that football Soccer, season is okay. do all end all. However, you know. That's going to be your one of your biggest. It is users is with one band. of our biggest users. Band and football, band and, football and, and soccer. Yeah. Soccer. At the same time. Soccer and, yeah. So, yeah. And so revenue. Said, it wouldn't be any yeah. different this year coming up. I'm not belittling yeah, track in any shape or form because trust me, as some incredible athletes we have in track. Um, I just worry time frame. I, wondering if it couldn't start in June after graduation and after senior night. But I see that you're saying how it's not feasible. I'm just putting it out there. No, I, I, I mean. In order to get to some point, there has to be some hurdles that we jump over, some it. downsides. Well, one of the biggest is going to be that all graduations are going to be inside this year. Yeah. They're all, you know, that's... It's going to like so that. they don't even get a choice. No, they don't have a choice. Let's hope it rains. And <laughs> <laughs> it's not our fault. I know. Okay, well... Any other questions? So I'd like to um, address the motion to approve Parks and Recreation Department through the county commissioners putting turf fields at the stadiums at Kent Island High School and Queen Anne's County High School. Do I have a motion to that effect? Do you want to amend that? Do you want to add to that? Pending. Pending. I, I, Sid, are you going to get us a good MOU or not? Yes, I will get you a good MOU. I mean, I'm taking a leap here, babe. I know you are. <laughs> I'm ta trust me, I'm taking a leap myself. <laughs> That's am I. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all in it up to our necks. Um, I'm confident. All right, well, then I. Investment uh, for our kids. So moved. <coughs> so moved. We have a second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second yeah. to approve Parks and Recreation Department through the county commissioners putting turf fields at the stadiums at Kennon and High School and Queen Anne's County High School. We need a vote, Mrs. Wright. Call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay, the motion carries. We're going to take, let's make it a 10 minute break. Okay. I know it's a long meeting, but we need to do this. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Wait, hold off. Right, everybody want like a quick break? Yes. Okay, we'll take it now. Welcome back to the board meeting. Um, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the FY 2020 budget. Um, I need a motion to approve the superintendent's FY 2020 budget as presented today. And then if we get a motion, we'll have a discussion after. Uh, so moved. I have a second. And a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the superintendent's FY 2020 budget as presented today. Um, this is right. Well, I have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Have I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do we have a discussion? Maybe a discussion. Sorry. Yes. The first thing I'll, I'll start out. Um, I just I'm hopeful that the commissioners will approve the spending level for the system. We've had informal, productive meetings with the commissioners the past couple of months, trying to work out reasonable expectations by both the county and the school board. The commissioners have expressed that they know we have been provided only state required amount the past two years. 
the MOE and the educational effort together. They know we are currently underwater with our budget. That was their term. They understand that we have had to cut into <coughs> funds and positions to pay for staff compensation <coughs> and the normal increases that do occur, like contract increases, cost of doing business increases. Um, that these occur with running a large organization. They have told us that they will work with us to provide funding over the course of a couple of years to bring us back above water. Um, this budget that we're presenting is a significant first step toward a multi-year budget process that will raise us back up in solid funding level where, where we would like to be, where we need to be, where the students need us to be. Since they locate that we have just approved the building of the turf fields, I am hopeful that they can also find some money to fund us the way we are entitled to be funded. We are required to be funded for um, our community. Um, they did find some funds for that, and um, we have approved it, and I think it's important that uh, we get funded for the entire budget that the superintendent uh, submitted. And I want to thank them in, in advance for working with us with this. Anyone else um, want to speak at that? Well, I just, uh, you know, all of, all of us are, as board members have a fiduciary responsibility to present the needs of the bud needs of our system. And I think that over our work sessions, you know, Dr. Kane and, and the executive team have shown that there is a greater need. This uh, budget that you are proposing is but a snapshot <laughs> of what really is needed. And I need to emphasize that. Um, I, I just feel like we we need more, but we'll trust me. I'm I would love to. I want I want to vote for this now so we can get can get this started. Uh, our, our, our you know our kids deserve it, so that's how I feel. Um, <coughs> you know, I've been pretty vocal over the past couple of years when we've only gotten MOE and. I know that there's times that county government can't give what we ask and what we think our children deserve, but I'm not sure we're living in those times right now. Um, our county is pretty pros prosperous. Uh, we increased our wealth, health, health, health wealth, or whatever that was mentioned in the budget. We're now the sixth wealthiest county in the state, but our funding level for our students from our local end is 22nd or 23rd out of 24 our kids deserve more when we have 30 30 requests for new positions within our 15 schools that's only two positions per school when you look at it in the scheme of things but we have to cut them all out because it's a 1.5 million dollar price tag and how can I go to the county commissioners and say we need $1.5 million worth of new teachers when we're struggling to support the ones we've got and keep the ones we've got? But our parents deserve small classrooms. And I'm not asking for 17 kids in a, in a classroom. You know, I, I have friends who are teachers and they easily handle 21 or 22 children. And it's all age appropriate. You know, certain classrooms can take more and, and others less. but the superintendent is the one that ought to be deciding how that happens and how those chess players get placed on the board. Not a budget or a dollar amount. So I'm just gonna ask the same thing Beverly has reached out to them and asked is to just keep us in mind and keep our 7,700 students in mind when you're thinking about our budget request because as Ms. Harper said, it's, it's almost bare bones. There's so much more we need, but we're futile when we ask for it because we understand there's limits, but we can't limit our children's education. And if we have people moving out of our county because they feel that our education system is too limited for their children, we're really barking up the wrong tree here. So, Michelle's turn. Uh, uh, it's pretty much a reiteration of what you all have said. Um, we're being very conservative in our ask compared to our needs. And I think the county commissioners need to be very aware of that and see the justifications for our ask. I think the budget in a more preventative measure, we're 
by providing a good education for our children, we're investing in better health outcomes in the future, we're investing in lower crime rates in the future, and we're investing in a more prosperous local economy. And if we don't educate our kids, either prepare them for further education or a career, they're not bringing back to our community. They're not going to be local business owners. They're not going to invest. They're going to move outside of this county and take their money with them. They're not going to live here. They're not going to buy property here. You know, I'm fortunate. I lived, I was raised here. I stayed here. I was able to, to make a decent living here. And I want my kids to have the same chance. So those are my feelings on it. Thank you. Bravo. Well, I just thank you uh, for supporting um, the budget in the way that you have. And over our several uh, work sessions and, you know, good questions are posed. And, you know, it's, it's a lot. We have big decisions to make, especially when the decisions mean that we can't um, ent entertain some of the requests that schools have and actually most of the requests that schools have. That, that's, a, um, that's a tough, tough <coughs> position. But I think that this board takes very seriously the balance that has to happen when we make these decisions. What is it that we want for our students versus being very realistic and practical about what we believe that our local government might be able to provide for us. So it's a tough decision. Um, but I thank each one of you for really giving it uh, your full, full attention and uh, coming to a place where we can, um, we can support a request to our county commissioners. So thank you. And I also want to take this moment to thank the staff in particular, Mr. Fister, for putting this together and helping us understand it's a giant task for you and it's a giant bunch of information that we have to absorb. So thank you for that, all of you. Thank you. I'd also go back to the principals. Yeah. You know, the principals have, have such a tough job and even coming to the superintendent with all the needs. I mean, it's just, it's a daunting task and it takes a village. To, to bring all this together. So, you know, kudos to everybody and thank thanks so much. Because yeah, they have to cut back just like mm -hmm. we do. I'm sure they would love to have asked for more than two Active. positions on average across the 15 schools we're supporting. Right. But yeah. they're given their conservative best, I think. And, and yeah, one school might need five and one might need nine, but the whole thing is, 7,700 students, 15 schools, 14 schools, and one large program, and two per, per spot is not a lot to increase our teaching staff. We lost teachers in the progression since we lost funding, and we've, I don't think, gotten back to the number of employees we used to have when we were at our height. And we are the biggest employer in this county, but we also need to retain our employees, and we need to make them be able to live here and work here and play here, as Mr. Um, Paluski and Dr. Kane always like to put into their presentations, and I love it because I get a tickle out of it. But yeah, we just have to, we have to move along with the times, and. I'm not an advocate for raising taxes or anything like that, but we have to do better by our students around here. I, I just am an advocate for these students. It's a great way to end the conversation, uh, Sharon. Thank you. So we have a motion on the table to approve the superintendent's FY 2020 budget as presented today. Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Mousset? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Thank you. Motion carries. Motion carries. Okay, the HR report. Kevin Kelly, I would ask that the board approve the HR report as presented. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the HR report as presented in closed session? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Of, of approving the HR report as presented in closed session. This is right. Board members, please again respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Uh, yes. Ms. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. Next item is a policy to go out for first read. Second. It's a policy, I'm oh, sorry, second read. It's a policy on policy development. I just want to say thank you to the policy committee for getting this one through. I read through it. it. It looks much better than they've been in a long time. 
Um, did you have any comments to make, Mrs. Ms. Harlow? Oh, you guys know I do. You've been running. Um, I want to take this moment to thank Mr. Farley for being so patient with me. I know I put a lot of demands out there. I know I denied a lot of requests to move forward. But I feel strongly about us being the education advocate for this community and that we are responsible for what we put out. And if we aren't putting out a good product, we come under fire for it and we get questioned as to how we can even be putting out a good student. So that is the reason I've been difficult. Mr. Farley brought this committee full circle from really very little input at all and, and really board members not even really taking the time to really read a policy and see if it made sense, see if there was a typo, an error, if the flow was wrong, if there was a cut and paste. I think we're all much more cognizant now. We want to put out a good product. We want our community to be proud of what we're putting out. We want them to understand our policies. We want them to be readable. And I just thank Mr. Farley for all the work that he did to get us to here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to add to that. Mrs. Jones, thank so much to her efforts. We have gotten this far. I mean, this policy is now under, not only just, re it's understandable. And, and the, one of the thing of it is, if you don't understand the language, how do you understand the work? Absolutely. And this made sense. Absolutely. So that she took so, so much time and effort. And, and um, I can't remember the young lady's name. Meredith. 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 Oh, gosh. I mean, all the time and effort she's put into this. So uh, I make the motion that we put this out for a second. Oh, I'll, I'll make the motion we put out for second read. Um, I'll second it. Yeah. Motion and second to put out the policy development policy number 110 and the regulation associated number 110 decimal one out for a second read. This as well right. as, you want to just go ahead and throw in the, the policy development sheet as well? What? The yellow the sheet. The yellow, the yellow sheet, sheet too. Yeah. Just put it all out for a second read. Yeah, okay. Is that how it reads? Okay, sorry, I apologize. Okay. okay. Thank you. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Ms. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. Next item is African American history course. I have vehicle mm -hmm. purchase. Mm -hmm. Transportation. Okay. I have I have oh, did that come off? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I have a vehicle Blame purchase. Last. Okay, the next item is the vehicle purchase. Mr. Spender. No, 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 transportation report. Yeah, this changed. Transportation report. Okay. You should have one of your binder. Did you have one of your binder? I don't know. Okay. All right. Sorry. We have four substitute bus drivers that are listed <laughs> that have met all the obligations um, and requirements by Queen Anne's County Public Schools that we would like to have approved tonight. Uh, <coughs> So they may be able to drive our buses. And they've okay. been vetted. I'm sorry, they've been vetted by you and yes, the, in Maryland. they've met all the requirements. Okay. Okay. To have a motion to approve <coughs> the four new bus drivers. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the four new bus drivers. Is there any discussion? I call for the vote. Is it right? Open base, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. I have four in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. They're approved. Thank you. Now vehicle purchase. Cap yeah. Captain Kelly, I'll, I'll take this one. Okay. Um, before you is an approval for uh, approval of a purchase order, uh, $50,070 to purchase a brand new Ford Super Duty um, truck, two-wheel drive with a box body and a, and a um, basically a lift gate on the back in order to replace our 21 year old vehicle that just gave up the gave up the ride here recently so uh, we've gone out we've done every due diligence as far as looking at uh, intercooperative purchasing agreements um, this one is done through uh, Sourcewell which is a national organization so we're very comfortable that the um, the amount purchased uh, the the amount requested here uh, is the lowest possible price for this. So we ask your approval to purchase a 2019 Ford Super Duty from the National Auto Fleet Group in the amount of $50,070 from our capital budget. And this, uh, but this 
we're we're not violating any of the bid rules by no we okay. are not okay. we are part of a Let's governmental cooperative absolutely <coughs> the source well contract is what the county government purchases a lot yes. of their vehicles with also so i need a motion to approve <coughs> the purchase of the 2019 ford super duty f 450 from the national auto fleet group in the amount of fifty thousand and seventy dollars so moved for a second and the motion is second uh is there any more discussion Call for the vote, Ms. Wright. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Captain Kelly? Aye. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Carla? Yes. Ms. Woodbat? Yes. I am for in the affirmative. Okay, motion carries. You Thank can you. Buy the truck. Thank you. Um, next item is the expenditure report. Expenditure report. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Uh, board members, before you, um, you have the expenditure status report, the standard monthly report. Uh, because of the transfers and everything that you approved last, uh, Last month, uh, our account balances look much more in line. Um, there are two things on the detail uh, expenditure report I want to call your attention to. There are two negative numbers, and they are all in, they're interrelated to each other. One is in special education with transfers. We had a new um, non-public placement uh, recently uh, contract with an agency or a non-public school that we haven't had contracts with before. So brand new student. Um, that requires these services, so therefore, um, it's exceeding our budget when we add that contract into our existing ones. Of course, something that, that wasn't planned. What category is that under, sir? Um, cat category six, special education, okay. eight thousand transfers. If you look all the way over to the right, it's a negative okay. forty-two thousand dollars. Is this for a student new to our system? Is it new? Mm -hmm. that we didn't expect and we don't always know that yeah, yeah. I, I don't it, know if it's a new student to the system or just new services oh, are required well but yes it was yeah yeah, yeah. something which was, can come about it's exceeding our budget and again this is okay one of those things reasons. that varies gotcha. but related to that if you if you look at category 9 student transportation in um, salaries and wages um, it's very um, close to being over and that's related to the bus drivers that we had to hire to transport this child over on the other side of the bridge so there are a couple little anomalies we'll be watching them I'll be working with mr. Pender here in the next couple uh, days or whatever to see how we can mitigate uh, some of our costs in transportation and special ed if it does require a transfer you will see that next month or in May as we go forward other than that everything seems to be fine uh, we are spending about 90% of our budget which is right online with where we were last year Okay. Any okay. questions? And then transfer well, notice next. Okay. Time. And then the transfer notice. I didn't mean to <laughs> go ahead of you. So the, uh, you have in front of you a just an information only item uh, is transfers within major categories uh, for what we anticipated in, in February. So we needed to do a transfer from salaries to contracted services uh, for the communication consultant due to the fact that we have a vacancy in our communication specialist position. And then, um, due to a software upgrade with ADP, which is our time management system, we had to go and replace all of our clocks at all of our locations so that our employees could swipe in and swipe out. Um, so that was eleven thousand nine hundred dollars. So that's, but again, it stayed within administration because of the vacancy. We we're able to utilize those dollars to fund these two particular items. Um, in instruction, salaries to contracted services, as you've heard multiple times over the last couple of weeks, the contract with the Equal Opportunity Schools. Partial funding is being provided by MSDE, $10,000 for each of the schools. This is the residual amount. And then, again, along with what we have to analyze in special education, for some of those vacancies that is now requiring contracted services to fill those needs, we're asking for a transfer or informing of a transfer within special education of $250,000 from salaries due to vacant, excuse me, vacant positions that now have to be filled with contracted positions. And I think you've seen this multiple times over the last few years. So the communication consultant, that is because we have a vacancy? Yes. So we went out and hired like a temp? Is that what this is? Actually, <clears throat> he is a consultant, so we don't have a temp employee that comes here when we have to do press releases, when we have to do uh, interact with the media and those kinds of things. He takes care of those for us. So he writes my comments, my statements, and press releases and those kinds of things. Okay. okay. Any questions? That was it for information only. Yes, for information. 
We don't need Because it's within category. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And the last me thing we have is, uh, well, community participation. Do we have anyone? You don't want to speak to us? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You don't want to talk to Come us? Come on, Mr. Aaron. Oh, Come right. on up. <laughs> Mr. Aaron, where are you going to be 6 30 tomorrow morning? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. You're going to be waving at me. Thanks, Dr. Okay, last item on our agenda is the future meetings and events. You know about the, and if you can look at your list there, the March for Our Schools. Um, you got that information from Mrs. Fields. Um, you see Queen Anne's County Winter Sports <coughs> Awards, Kent Island Winter Sports Awards night. Uh, Mr. Todd is a county administrator, and they, He's one who has resigned and is moving elsewhere to work, and they're having an open house on his in his <coughs> honor. The big one I want to look at was the March 19th at 5 o'clock. That is the day we are presenting, or the superintendent's presenting the legislative audit, uh, um, audit probably Mr. Fister too, uh, results of that. I think it's important that they hear about that audit because we have just deleted some of the... Um, the help we were going to have to to comply with some of those audit requests we took that out of our budget um, so it's good to have it then so they can see what we had and why some of the items we were delinquent on is because we didn't have enough funding we talked about that when we saw the audit um, and she's also going to be presenting the FY20 budget to the county commissioners It is a good meeting for all of us to show up if at all possible it's important um, and so we can uh, support our superintendent on this uh, the 20th is the regular school board work session for March, uh, 11 a.m. And I've told you the two items we're doing on that one, and prim primarily working on the handbook and also working on the superintendent's um, evaluation form. Um, the 3rd of April is our regular school board meeting. The 17th is our regular work session. Those two work sessions go back to the 11 o'clock time frame. And that's it. Any questions on the scheduling? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. Second. A motion, second to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Aye.